welcome to everyone. Good morning. Glad to have everybody here. The, the chair, Phil, is at home and will not be here because of a travel glitch that occurred too late to be able to resolve it. So Phil will be on by <coughs> telephone probably from about 11 o'clock on and <clears throat> I'll be ch chairing the meeting. So Mike, what, what do you have for us to start out with? Well, welcome to our fourth meeting. And uh, let me just remind everyone that today's meeting is being recorded. It's not being webcast live, but it is being recorded and this is a, a public meeting and we will have a, a sign-in sheet so we would like people to uh, at some point during a break uh, make sure that they sign in so that we know that they're here and we do have a, a copies of the agenda on the table by the door so uh, with that uh, I think that covers it. Barn, do you want to yeah. take over? Well, why don't we <coughs> introduce ourselves and then we'll have the audience introduce themselves. I'm Bernard Schwartz, the vice chair <coughs> for CHAP, and I'll be chairing today. I'm Chris Jennings um, from Virginia Commonwealth University, Biostatistics. <laughs> <coughs> Olga Koch from Royal University in Bochum, Germany, Human Biomonitoring Exposure Assessment. Russ Hauser from Harvard School of Public Health, uh, Environmental Epidemiology. Uh, Stan Barone, US EPA, um, Assistant Center Director for Human Health Risk Assessment. Uh, let, let's, let's finish the rest of the oh, oh, chapter first. Paul. Paul Leoy, Robert Wood Medical School in the Environmental Occupational Health Sciences Institute, New Jersey. And this doesn't switch on? Yeah, mine didn't switch on. <coughs> I don't think it. It's very faint. Is it? Yes, sir. I'm faint as too, as well. It's more good. I'm Andreas Gott, oh, Camp. Yes, School of Pharmacy, University of London, in London, United Kingdom. And Mike Babbage from CPSC. <coughs> Steve Rosano, American Chemistry Council, Valley Esther Tibet. Brenda Hallow, Ferro Corporation. John Butala, representing Ferro. Anne Clausen, Latham and Watkins. Angela Rollins, ExxonMobil Chemical Company. Amy Blackman, ExxonMobil Biomedical Sciences. Pat Harmon, uh, BASF. Laurie Keller, ExxonMobil Corporation, Public and Government Affairs. Quinn Dodd, Vince Levin, representing ExxonMobil. Sean Oberly, Product Safety Letter. Sarah Garland, CPSC, and Statistician. Dominique Williams, CPSC, and Health, uh, Health Sciences. Leslie Patton, CPSC, Health Sciences. Ken Carlson, CPSC, Health Sciences. Well, thank you all. Thank all of you for being here. Chip members have no choice, but you have a choice. So thanks. <laughs> thanks for coming. <coughs> Mike, did you have other things that you wanted to follow up on before I talk a little bit about what we hope to accomplish today in the park? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to give a, a brief update on what CPSC has been doing. Um, we have, uh, uh, we're still working on toxicity reviews of, of the phthalates. Uh, we started with the six phthalates that are subject to the regulation. We gave, recently presented the CHAP with uh, 
a list of I think it's 17 additional uh, phthalates and we have 10 more coming from the uh, coming from Versar that are starting to trickle in so by the end of next month uh, or soon after we hope to have at least drafts of the remaining ones so that'll give us a total of 30 some toxicity reviews and let's see we uh, <coughs> we're also uh, working on or I think we just completed a an update of the literature review for phthalates so uh, we'll be able to get that to the chat shortly uh, this is to cover the last couple of years worth of literature since our reviews and, and some of the other materials we've given you have been uh, been completed <coughs> yeah, those are uh, I guess the main the main primary activities uh, we also continue to coordinate with the other agencies uh, we're still awaiting some information from the Food and Drug Administration on uh, phthalates in pharmaceuticals and we're also uh, planning on putting together uh, some chemical information chemical use information once we've completed the tox reviews on the 30 plus chemical chemicals uh, 30 plus phthalates we're going to pull together some of the information on uh, usage and how they're used and what the relative production is and so on so we get a better handle on which ones might be more more significant or more um, important to human uh, exposures and I forgot about the exposure assessment uh, well we continue uh, we're continuing to pull together some of the exposure data uh, it, most of its covered in the Versar review but we're pulling just pulling out the actual numbers and getting that into a form where uh, where Paul can use it for uh, a scenario based exposure assessment and in addition our uh, human factor staff are pulling together some of the use information um, frequency of use that sort of thing frequencies and durations <coughs> and, and you know consumer use patterns um, so we're pulling all of that together and I guess the uh, we also uh, recently along with the 17 tox reviews uh, had a included a review for one additional phthalate substitute we had a, an original list of five so now we've got toxicity reviews on on six of them and I think that's a sums sums up um, we're keeping in touch with EPA and uh, Health Canada Health Canada has got some well in California has biomonitoring biomonitoring programs underway uh, there probably won't be data in time to benefit the chat but we're uh, keeping close tabs on on other those other activities and I think that about covers it are you aware of any other either US agency or non US government it's about to come out with some document that is going to potentially significantly impact what we do yeah uh, no I mean the 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 other uh, agency working on this right now is EPA and actually a couple of different programs but we expect to be done before before them although they may have some uh, external review drafts of some of their reports that we can look at if they're you know, as soon as they're ready uh, that may likely happen before we're we're done <coughs> 
but I think our work will be completed well before the EPA. <coughs> Speaking of being done, can you remind us of when we're supposed to be done? The deadline is from the time uh, that you were officially appointed uh, a day before the first meeting or whenever we started traveling. So that would make it about April 13th. So our deadline would be sometime in April around that time in 2012. So we've got, uh, we're about halfway there. And I think we're, I think we're making good progress. <clears throat> Mike, we're at a, <clears throat> we're at a stage in developing work product now where there will be an increasing interest from the media and other people who are wanting to see what we're doing. What remind us of the policies that you have for us being contacted by the media or wanting copies of our work product, either as individuals or as a committee? Yeah. And well, all our meetings, of course, are open to the public. And, and in fact, you can view them on the website. There are uh, even transcripts of a sort available. It's actually closed captioning, so they're a little, uh, they're not edited, but they're uh, also available. Um, we held a public meeting uh, in last uh, July where we heard uh, testimony from the public, including uh, non-governmental organizations and industry people. And we continue to receive comments periodically from interested parties. Uh, in fact, we just received a, a lengthy package from the Thalate Esters panel, and along with some other information. Um, so the, the overall, our goal is to be transparent. However, the drafts are for the chap and they are are not the drafts are not released there is um, there won't be any uh, as far as I know no opportunities for uh, external peer review that sort of thing and as far as communicating uh, outside parties with the chap First off, anything that comes into the chat is public information gets posted on our website. So, I'd like to remind you, remind everyone of that. Um, and we prefer that all communications come through to us. Uh, that people uh, on the outside who want to submit information submit it to me or the commission and we'll see that the chat uh, receives it. Uh, the chap is, uh, you know, not obligated to speak to people on the outside. Uh, they're certainly not obligated to speak to the media at any time. Uh, so, uh, you know, generally, uh, the purpose of all, well, everything should be in the open, all the, all the incoming information is uh, yeah, um, in the open, uh, open to the public. Uh, but the CHAP report itself is confidential until it's, <coughs> it's ready to be released. <clears throat> but if someone from the media contacts us, yeah. and we say we're not free to release information, and they say, but, just this one, just this one question. The best thing to do is to contact uh, <coughs> well, either me or our public affairs office, Scott Wilson or Patty Davis, and I will get their phone numbers um, and keep them handy. Uh, 
because all at CPSC all media requests have to go through them anyway. So, so we should our, our response to a media question is to talk to Mike. Yes. At this point, and I will tell him to talk to Scott or Patty. So, but as we develop written components of the eventual report <clears throat> that's all protected as a work product of chat yeah it's cons I think the lawyers call it pre-decisional or something like that it's uh, it's incomplete work so and that incomplete work can go right up until we have a document that we're willing until to it's it, it's all done and it's released to the public yes. and the Commission at the same time yeah. okay the commissioners see at the same time the public does. So none of us should feel pressured by anybody, whether it's a different federal agency or a manufacturer or some researcher, we, we shouldn't feel pressured to share with them our work product. Correct. Okay. Because it's pretty it's pretty harmful to a committee activity when that happens when somebody else is out there doing steps just ahead of you because they got a copy of what you were doing. Right, and, and you know, part of the, I guess, part of the reason for it is so that there's no, uh, uh, you know, any, there's no influence. I mean, everything is, is done. The idea, is, we op CPSC operates under the Sunshine Act, so the idea is to keep things uh, public all uh, interactions, uh, outside communications, public. Which means that when we're ready to show somebody, we're ready to show everybody. Right, right. Not an individual. Right. Okay. And it's why, well, it's why this meeting is open. It's why when, if um, some of the people uh, sitting here want to meet with us, it has to be a public meeting and it has to be in the public calendar uh, in a, a week or so in advance of the meeting. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. That's <clears throat> helpful clarification. Any, any comments from any of the chat members? Questions or comments about this? Okay. Good. <clears throat> Let me say a few words about what I think we need to do today and tomorrow. We have now committed a fair amount of effort in these past months to begin to document what our assignments would look like. So we have written materials, we have calculations, we have analyses, we're, we're, we're gathering information based on assignments that were made a few months ago. And I think the purpose of this meeting would be to see that what we are starting on puts us on the right track to be able to answer the questions that were assigned to CHAP because there are interesting things that we might do but if they are tangential to what our assignment is they may not be helpful and in fact it may be distracting because it will consume <coughs> a lot of time and energy on things that we may not have a place for in the report. So I think it's a, a critical time for us to find out if our individual contributions begin to fit <coughs> together in a way that's going to be helpful to us in meeting the charge. So because each of our contributions is slightly different from each other, uh, there isn't one criterion that we can use, but I think it's important to know about the content <coughs> of what we have produced is it right? Is it the right thing, for example, with Phil and I summarizing the literature on reproduction and development from animal studies? Is that what you're going to need when, you, because we have to have documented in the literature review what you're going to use, for example, in the hazard index analyses so that you're not counting on data that came from nowhere as far as the report is concerned. 
and we, in order to do a broad review of the literature, we may have to include, and will include things that you're not going to use, but it would be noteworthy if you were counting on calculations, numbers, no ills, whatever they might be, that Phil and I hadn't provided a reference for in our section. So we, we need to see that we have the correct balance of information to support each other. To some extent, we need to begin to think about style. So the, the report when it's done doesn't look like it was authored by eight different people. We want it to look like there was one common <coughs> style that we use. And it's too wor it's too early to worry about that seriously yet. That we can work on as we go. But just one example <coughs> is how we're going to handle bibliographic citations. Are we going to have one bibliography for the whole report, or are we going to have bibliographies after each section? That you'd have you'd have references specific to what that person's assignment was, which has some sense for it. But on the other hand, people will use other people will use the list of references for a different purpose, and they will want them all to be together in one place at the end of the document. And they don't want to have to go and look through eight different places in the report to find <coughs> citations. And also then to find out that in three or four of those sets of references, there's about a 50% duplication of references. So we, that's a style kind of thing that we need to talk about as we go so to make the job <coughs> easier to bring it together as, at the end. As we talk today and tomorrow, we need to identify are there any areas that we haven't assigned coverage, things that we still need to have that we haven't included in the earlier assignments, and we need to find out if that information is available, and who's going to take that assignment, and what what's the product of that assignment. So we need to make sure that we don't end up in another few months realizing that there was a hole in <coughs> the assignments and it's very difficult for somebody to proceed because of some other piece of information not having been pulled together. If if we have meetings, Mike, I'm thinking out loud and that's always dangerous, but I'm, I'm just trying to think of how many more meetings we might have. If we continue to meet at three month intervals, we would have three or four more meetings. Yeah. And that gives you a kind of a feel for the pace at which we have to go. I would think by the time we meet again in a few months, and we'll talk about this at the end of tomorrow, but by the, by the time we have our next meeting, we should have a, a pretty good rough draft to begin to look at, because it'll take a couple of meetings of polishing and filling in the remaining holes. And deciding do we really want that as a conclusion or not? Do we want that as a recommendation? So if we if we consume very many more meetings on mechanics, we're not going to have much time to, to discuss the recommendations. So I, I would say we need at least two meetings to talk about recommendations and sort that out. And maybe one more meeting, and I consider this meeting today to be one of mechanics. One more meeting of mechanics so that we have enough of a draft that we can all go back and then think before that second meeting out, think about what we personally feel the recommendations should look like and have a draft of recommendations before that second meeting out so that we come prepared knowing that this will be the first time that we're really forced to declare what we're thinking. And I, we'll take, that'll take a meeting. To, to just reach agreement on what we really meant by those recommendations and whether it's responsive and whether it's we can reach agreement. Like I'm not sure what what rules we are under. If we want to make some specific recommendations, are we going to vote on them one by one? Or how do we reach how do we reach consensus on recommendations? That maybe we don't have to answer that today, but that's the kind of thing we need to be thinking about. For, for that meeting when we talk about it. So we have three or four meetings left, that's all. Anyhow, those are the kinds of, so, so that what I haven't said yet is that 
we don't intend to go through our work products today line by line to do wordsmithing <coughs> or anything of that kind. We, if we started that, we could be here for several days. <coughs> and that was, that's, from my standpoint, that wasn't the intent of, of today. But instead to look at content and whether or not what one of us is doing is is useful to everybody else and to begin to think of how it's going to fit together and look as a report. Now, I, I would welcome your comments and thoughts about whether or not that, that's a clear enough mission for today and tomorrow and whether or not you agree with it. I don't think we're going to be done in a couple of hours, but I also don't think we're going to be struggling at 3 o'clock tomorrow wondering how we're going to get the other half of the meeting done. Anybody else? Any thoughts about what we want to accomplish today and whether or not we can? <coughs> I, I think I agree with, with what, what you meant, Tom. Thanks, Andrews. Thanks. I, I, I think it's a good plan. Um, I think you should meet as often as you need to, but not necessarily more often um, but uh, in terms of style things uh, one thing that we might want to do well at some point <coughs> might be easier to do it sooner rather than later but to agree on some uh, uh, abbreviations and uh, that sort of thing uh, you know are we going to call them phthalate esters for short or alcohol diesters or whatever that that kind of thing just it's a, whether we do it now or at the end it doesn't matter but um, we're gonna have to, to agree on that you know and agree on a style for the citations and again you know that can be done at the end but it would be more efficient to but it's more efficient now. more efficient but just about, well, put it this, it'll make my job easier at the end. <laughs> That's important. <clears throat> well, for one thing, we need to agree on what are the chemicals that we're going to cover. And the, the agreement about the nomenclature is important because we're going to have those words in tables, we're going to have them in text, we're going to use them widely, and it would be, it's more efficient for us to agree on some of those definitions and terms now than to try to retrofit things after the report is 90% done. That's, that's a good point. Uh, those two and how we're going to pull together the references. That if, so if you can give us an example of what you know, several different kinds of references should be, whether they're peer-reviewed journals or whether they're government documents or whatever, if you could give us some examples there, then as we write our sections, we can well, begin to modify them now to adapt to that. Well, I can do that, but it's, you don't necessarily have to follow that style. Well, I mean, as, well, we have to have a consistent style. Yeah. But you're saying that if we wanted to do it in a different format as a, as a report, and they're all the, the, that same format. Right, right. That's not a problem. Right. Okay. But if we had an example that we could start from, if we want to <coughs> argue for a different one, we can. Oh, okay. Well, in order to keep us <coughs> focused for the discussion, <clears throat> for the rest of today and tomorrow. I thought it would be helpful to review and to lay out what are, what are the questions that we are really trying, that we should be looking at as we talk about the hazard index approach, as we talk about the animal data, as we talk about the human data. So at the third tab in your book is the list of questions that you've seen from an email earlier. So the first one being, how do the hazard profiles of the temporarily banned phthalates compared to those of the banned phthalates? I think we need to have an answer to that. <coughs> 
because we are being asked for recommendations specific to what to do about the ones that are currently banned or those that are restricted. Is the <coughs> mode of action of any of the temporarily banned phthalates the same as the mode of action for the banned phthalates? I think we need to be able to answer that and know what we're going to do with those that are, are restricted. And based on human exposures, what are the risks of human exposure to any of the temporarily banned phthalates? Now that is something to which we will only have a general idea at this point, and we don't have that fixed yet from any discussions or analyses, but as we look at whether or not we're on the right track, we, <coughs> we at some point have to answer that question. And do any of the phthalate substitutes reviewed in this report have similar toxicologic properties to the banned ones, we have to be able to answer that to know if there are others that we should ban, recommend banning, we don't have any authority to ban anything, but would we recommend banning based on that profile? And do any, let's see, that was number five. No, that was four. Do any of the phthalate substitutes review that have a mode of action similar to those of banned <coughs> phthalates? And based on human exposures, what are the risks of human exposure to any of the phthalate substitutes? In order to know whether or not we have some things out there that may be as bad or worse than some of the phthalates that we're worried about, we need, we need to have that information. And then we added one more that goes beyond the charge, the specific charge to CHAP, it, it lies underneath a lot of our discussions. And as, as we, at least for me, as I read more and more of the literature and have heard the discussions that you've put forward, it's important for us to have a real good handle on the metabolism so that we know, I mean, first of all, it's a question of the combinations of, of the, the contributing factors that account for the toxicity that we see. It isn't just the paramaterial, it's the paramaterial plus the metabolites. Some metabolites are sufficient in themselves. So it makes it a more complex picture. I, I think we have to have some goal here for clarifying to the best of our knowledge what role do the metabolites of these materials contribute to what we see as the toxicity of phthalates because it would, we would be remiss with the amount of knowledge out there if we simply talk about the diesters. So I think that's a set, we, we need to be working toward answering that mm. question, even though that, I don't think that was a specific charge to CHAMP. But our, I think our colleagues out there would expect that we would address that in the same way that we would have a special section on mode of action as it relates to the toxicity and risk and a few other broad, broader questions of that kind. Thoughts? Thoughts about, is this, does this create a framework for us to go forward through the day knowing that these are the things that we want to be able to address? Not every one of these by every section that we're talking about, but collectively we need to cover these. Am I missing something here? Do you, do you disagree with, with some of these? Or is this enough to keep in the back of our mind that as we consider the contributions of individual people, that if it doesn't fit one of these, why are, why are we <coughs> on that track? Chris? Can I just add something? So, sort of thinking um, back to the NRC report on phthalates and the idea of um, looking at common adverse outcomes as a way of grouping chemicals. Um, I, I think that you know we've been talking about sort of common adverse outcomes being related to anti-androgenicity. Um, it's certainly the case that, that, my understanding is that phthalates aren't the only group of chemicals in that group. Um, I think before we've talked about the fact that we don't start you know, at zero, we have background exposures to chemicals outside of phthalates that might be considered similar enough to phthalates. So um, I think that's a, a really important question, and I, I don't, I think it adds a lot of complexity to what we're doing, but uh, it, I think it may be worth stepping into that. 
responses to Chris? I'm Comment? Worried, I'm worried about that. We have enough complexity. Is that better? <coughs> we have enough complexity with phthalates and phthalate substitutes in their own right. And to broaden this question to other chemicals really requires an incredible amount of work. And I'm not sure if we have the time or effort available to us to prioritize how this set of chemicals relates to other sets of chemicals that may in fact lead to the outcomes that you just described. I, I, don't, I, I guess I'm kind of thinking not that we would spend <coughs> as much time on these other sets of chemicals, but to have enough of a uh, background review uh, in the report that would provide you know, evidence of how similar other chemicals may be in terms of that very well could be in the grouping. Um, you know, it is a it is a tough problem because it's hard to know where the boundary is. Yeah. But the, I don't know that that means we shouldn't even address the question um, in, in whatever limited way or. I, I'm not even sure yet how we address the question of either additivity, antagonism, or synergism among phthalates or phthalate-like compounds in our own in our own analysis and how that deals with the issue of you know, exposure in the real world. It, it does in fact um, it does in fact lead to a whole new set of questions that we have to consider and I'm not sure we're gonna be able to do that. Andrews um, can I observe that that we are going over the same ground repeatedly. We discussed that at uh, the previous meeting and the meeting before. And I think there's kind of a consensus here that, number one, we cannot ignore combination effects between several phthalates. Yeah, I agree. Number two, totally agree there is repeatedly mapped out in the bibliot literature and here in the panel a way of dealing <coughs> with this, so there shouldn't be a problem. Number three, there's also um, empirical evidence of combination effects between phthalates and other chemicals. And we've also discussed this, and I think number four, we've agreed here in this panel that these effects cannot be ignored. We have to take them into account in some <coughs> way. However, it may be open to discussion how this can be achieved precisely, but I think it should. Well, we've discussed it last time, and I think, I feel there was a consensus there. And I guess that's the reason I brought it up. That's been in my mind, and I didn't see that as part of these questions. So I, if, if, if your point about these questions is to limit to these questions, then that seemed to be not part of that, and that's why I brought that up. Thank you for, for raising it. <clears throat> and Andrews, I think you're right. We have this custos, and I, I think there was a, a general agreement about it as an issue. How, how to get there from here is yeah I mean as an issue I have no problem with it it's an issue we all know that it's an issue it's what degree of how how far it rises in our analysis that takes us away from some of the central points that we're going to have to deal with do we ban you know phthalates from children's toys or phthalate like compounds I mean that's our basic you know it's our basic question, and, and, and you have to be, we have to be careful that we don't get sidetracked from something that we all know is important. We all discuss that. I just want to make sure we hit the target when we're finished. Andres, I, uh, I I realize yeah. your concerns and they are to a degree mine as well, and maybe we can answer this. <coughs> I wanted to bring to the table an issue related to that, which is at the end of the day we need to. Well, the, the charge, the remit of this panel is fairly wide, and it, this is defined and laid down in, in the legislation. And there are many um, aspects which we need to address, um, but I think the key point is we're being asked to say whether or not the existing ban should, on the satellite should continue, and whether the intermediate ban should be made permanent or not. And I think that's the nub of the issue. There are other issues which we need to address as well. Um, but I feel we, we began this discussion last time already, but I feel we need to 
get a little clearer in our minds um, in terms of <coughs> what evidence is needed, what criteria are needed in order to enable us to make this decision. For example, do we need exposure assessment uh, data for this decision or not? Um, is it based on hazard assessment only? Um, I think the questions tabled are very helpful in, in sorting this out and helping us address this. But th this is uh, where I feel we need a bit more clarity. So let's talk about that more. <coughs> Mike, a question for you. In, in terms of the things that chat should be addressing, if we get into areas that involve chemicals over which uh, CPSC has no regulatory authority, then are we wasting our time? Right. Well, you know, um, the way I look at it is our, our goal is to look at the phthalates, and that is a huge job in itself. <clears throat> and if, if we can do that, that'll be fantastic. Um, anything <clears throat> beyond that is okay. <clears throat> I w you know, I'd never say don't do it because, <clears throat> uh, you know, if, if it's uh, relevant to public health, uh, but it's not our main focus. And <coughs> that's the, what I gathered from the last time we discussed this uh, was a sense that this is something that would be part of the discussion, but, you know, maybe an illustrative example or two, but, but not the focus of the risk assessment. But, it, but certainly to point out that this is, by the way, there are these other compounds that uh, may also be important. I mean, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't say don't put that in the report. I think there are <coughs> colleagues who are not members of CHAP who understand very well that there are some obvious things that we have to put our finger on besides just the phthalates to understand the risk of phthalates. And if we don't do that, they will accuse us in one way or another of <coughs> falling short of the mark of having not addressed the ghost out there that's just beyond the margin. So I think we have to consider that, and we, it would be remiss if we didn't. But for us to go about searching for all the possible interactive chemicals out there with the phthalates is impossible. And we, w first of all, we, that would be hard to know what they are, and it would be hard to get, to get exposure data on them. So that would be a waste of exercise in mm -hmm. our, our time. However, there are some obvious examples, and you've already approached that in the hazard index work that you've done, to, to look at an example or two where we have reason to believe that there could be an interaction. And part of the concern that might appear to be a phthalate might be the combination of that and something else. So I, I think we have to have, and they might be real world examples or theoretical examples of the chemicals that we should be worried about beyond the list of phthalates in front of us that would account for the real risk <coughs> of those phthalates. So, Perhaps there's a way that we can do that without getting in, stuck in the swamp of all of those chemicals and all of the exposures, but have some theoretical examples of this is the kind of chemical, <coughs> this is the kind of mode of action that we would worry about if we're worried about anything enhancing the apparent toxicity of a phthalate. So I, I think we could handle that by example and not get buried in the swamp. Paul? Our, our book doesn't have our original charge in it. Yes, yeah, towards the end. Is it toward the end? Yeah. yeah. I, I usually find the third to the end. So thank you. Is that? It's, it's 12, but except they're not letting me read it. Sorry, I'm having problems. Is this the prohibition? Yes. yes. Can I just add to that? So, just adding um, to what Ron said, um, and, and maybe what Andreas is getting to as well when he starts talking about uh, hazard uh, evaluation, you know, looking at what's going to be in the background 
chapters if we're interested in anti-androgenicity. Uh, just some review of, I, mean, I, I remember there being some sections of that in the phthalate uh, NRC report about some in vitro testing or something, or, you know, it doesn't have to be in detail, but some, something like that in the toxicity section might be helpful. <coughs> what, what, what I can see as a relevant for, point for this panel is uh, to consider the question whether, uh, for example, hypothetically, we come to the view that uh, phthalate X um, is relatively harmless, then we would have to consider the question, does this alter in any way in light of the published evidence about yeah. combination effects between phthalates and various other chemicals, for example. But, but to that degree, without venturing into what you mapped out, Bernie, and having to look at each and every combination that's rather futile anyway, or without having <coughs> to reflect on quantitative implications of, of such evidence, I don't think that would be uh, possible in view of the lack of data. But I think what is feasible is to reflect uh, in what way any view, <coughs> decision, and recommendation may be altered, uh, taking into account exposure to this other case qualitatively rather than quantitative. Does that make sense? It <coughs> makes sense, but it doesn't quite make sense with the charge. Yeah. I think so the relationship to well because most of the most of the discussion is not is basically on health effects of phthalate alternatives other than or phthalate not right. other chemicals that may in fact have similar health effects to phthalates. That's where our question becomes because it doesn't say that explicitly. Well, and it's in fact in the NRC report, um, EPA asked for a study a report on phthalates and the committee insisted on putting in, mentioning these other chemicals. So, um, you know, it's we, we've got to answer the charge questions first. Right. But on the other hand, I think the panel might be remiss if they don't at least mention these other chemicals. But I think that's not my point is not the mentioning, it's the degree <coughs> of evidence that we're going to be searching for for these other chemicals in our analysis, which right. may, and may in fact be uh, a level of, of analysis that's not warranted at this point, maybe warranted by another committee when you're looking at synergism and that. I, I think the key word design. is another committee. Yeah. I mean, that's the way I look at it. It's not ignoring it, it's saying, you know, how much time and effort can we put to it based upon the charge questions we have to answer at the beginning of anyway, which are, kind of, which are quite complex. I agree with you, Paul. And there's another aspect of this that I have considered in looking beyond the phthalates. If, if we give too much attention to some chemicals or classes of chemicals beyond the phthalates that are concerned, maybe by mode of action or by structure or whatever it might be, and the readers of the report pick up that this is really a report on those, let's say, anti-androgens, yeah. mm -hmm. and they use that as the focus to argue about the strength or weakness of our report and they ignore our contribution on the phthalates, right. then we have given it too much attention. That's right. Yeah. I, I totally agree. So the, the, the amount, we have to be able to let the readers know that we're aware of this as a concern mm -hmm. and why, but not get into it to the extent that it becomes something that the proponents <coughs> of another issue use in, instead of phthalates. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have no problem with that approach. So, if, if let, let's keep that kind of as a rule of thumb when we, when we handle this, that we don't have to ignore it, but it, we just don't want it to become the, the focus of the report for somebody else. Is that reasonable? Hold yeah. on. I think we can again discuss this when we are talking about our hazard index approach, because yes. there we also add other anti androgens into the calculation right. formula, but yep. only as an add-on, I would say. But the problem I have is that while I've been trying to construct scenarios with um, 
Mike, on exposure, which we haven't done a calculation yet on, who's doing that? Is, is that going to be Bursar who's going to do that for it, the calculation? We have to decide. Um, I want to make sure that we hit the right targets, you know, as to what we do the calculations for and how they relate to the hazard index in the end, because the exposure calculations will lead to an intake dose for each one of the scenarios. And therefore, and we're going to have a, you know, we'll probably have lots and lots of, of information from these from the analysis. And the, the degree to which we do sensitivity analysis on two will warrant further consideration. But we got to keep our target straight because if I start adding on the having the arrow of the chemicals, then we got a problem. Russ? I think it's on now. Um, kind of it's changing direction from what we were talking about in terms of the other chemicals, but in terms of what Paul brought up, um, I, I guess in terms of the concern with assessing exposure from children's products, toys, which would be the, the main um, peer view of the CPSC. <coughs> but in the um, public law, it does in section four, you know, specifically mention as well as from other sources sure. of exposure. So I don't think we should really limit ourselves to children's exposures just from child care products because specifically says um, from other sources such as cosmetic products, etc. So, you know, even though <laughs> the recommendations would be in reference to children's products and toys. I think we need to consider other sources of phthalate exposure, well, and just making that explicit, you know, rather the, than to ease your mind. We actually do have household products, personal care products, and diets consideration. I'm just not sure how far <coughs> we can get with it because of the the, the lack of data. You know, but it is in there. The critical issue which I thought that Homer and I agreed upon last meeting is that if we do these calculations and look at children's toys and we find there's minuscule or large contributions to a daily dose that they calculate from biomonitoring data, then we can say infer the other sources either have contributions or no contributions and that will lead to a whole set of other questions of what do you do now. We need, it's, it's not. It's something where at least we'll be able to infer whether or not this is a big issue, a little issue. And if it's a little issue, well, then there's a whole lot of work that has to be done to figure out where the real source of this value to come from. By issue, you by by issue you mean the contribution from children's right. toys and products right. to proportionally how much that individual is exposed to. Right. That yeah. may be the best we can do at this point, which is pretty far advanced considering what other people. But right, if, if we are able to do that, I'm not sure that we have the data. But we'll see what we have. Yeah. <coughs> I think there is some benefit to having the report cover <coughs> information areas a little bit bigger than what the minimum charge is. Because there will be a lot of people who will look at the report and if they're silent on something, they will wonder, well, did, did they look at it or not? And I mean, maybe if they had looked at it, they would have drawn a conclusion on it. They didn't say anything. So if there are things that we look at and we conclude that we don't have enough data, I think that's important to have in the report. Yes. I, I, I agree. It's important to say what you uh, looked for but didn't find or something to that effect that we consider certain things. Russ, did you have more? Well, the, what Mike said just made me think that probably would be a chapter on, you know, gaps or limitations in the report. You know, maybe would appear within chapters, but as a as a chapter. I'm not sure it's listed in the outline or not. I didn't. But when when Mike was mentioning that, then. it would be rare if researchers would review an area and not have recommendations for further research. <laughs> Or, or, you know, very very specific gaps of what we were yeah. missing well, or... Well, those recommendations would reflect what the gaps are. So 
I agree. That's a list that we should be keeping in mind that we can recall and pull into a chapter at, at the end. Because that, that's complementary to the rest of the report. Because if it, it, it helps to understand the uncertainty of some of the things that we did talk about, if we come back and make a recommendation to gather more information about this, that suggests that there was some element of uncertainty or they wouldn't have recommended gathering more information. So I agree. And also it might be full of gaps. Your task of compiling the importance of all the external exposure sources is very important. Even if it's full of gaps. Well, it, it kind of creates a, a field for the next chap to work at. Mike's looking forward to the chap number three. <laughs> Well, <laughs> you know, the commissions only had uh, <coughs> oh, three or four chaps, I think. And this is the third one on phthalates. Well, no, I think we had, uh, I know we had one on formaldehyde, but this is the third on, for, on phthalates. So. Well, one thing I hope, I can, uh, and Chris, I'd like you to think about, I hope you will, is that, you know, you're doing the biomonitoring component of this. I just think that spot measurements are full of uncertainties, and I really think that there's got to be some recommendations to, you know, how we reduce the uncertainties. I know you're going through a very thorough discussion of the limitations and, and at least where you're going to be able to take the data and how much uncertainty around it, but I think that's an incredibly powerful recommendation about what we really need for biomonitoring video to make it worthwhile <coughs> as a tool that can be used substantively rather than in a way that we used to use air pollution data to, you know, manufacture information on air pollution exposure alone. So something to really think about. I think it's a really big area where you have a chance to make an impact. I think there's no, it's not, it's no shame to point out the variabilities, but actually we have to be aware that biomonitoring just gives you a picture on the variability of exposure that's actually taking place. Mm -hmm. So it's not the biomonitoring data in my perception that is variable in itself, but it's the exposure. So you, as, as you've yeah. seen from very, from a lot of publications, that um, for certain phthalates we have rhythmic exposure in the morning using body care products. For other phthalates we have um, exposures through certain types of contaminated foodstuff. So we have only exposure peaks on two days during the week. But biomonitoring merely pictures what's going on. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And the key thing is how does one expand the design of biomonitoring studies to do something more fruitful in terms of understanding variability, understanding mean better, so that when you do these calculations, the uncertainty is reduced because you understand the variability better. I think it was when Earl and Earl, Earl Gray and Paul Foster were here that we started a discussion on what is important, what is the key important finding on the toxicity of phthalates. Is it peak exposure sets of importance or is it the area under the curve? <coughs> we, we have to relate all our knowledge to these yeah. modes of action to, to, to relate it there. Thank you. Chris, thank you for <coughs> raising your point to stimulate some good discussion. Are there any other big picture issues? Well, I, you know, I think, um, I defer to Holger, but I, I think there are studies that address the variability of, of biomonitoring in the spot versus 
all day samples and so on. So it's just that the, the biggest data set is spot urines. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, I think we'll have some sense of, of the uncertainty variability. Olga, do you think that's enough, or the frequency of sampling has to change to be to really reduce the uncertainty and variability? That's exactly what I try to point out. Yeah. If we have five measurements of an individual, and one of it is high and the other ones are low, what does it tell us? It tells us that one of the measurements was high. So that this individual had a high exposure, or maybe one time high exposure over the week. But can we neglect it, or we have to we have, we have to make a mean over out of it? I think that's not the case, because all the key toxicology data shows us it's peak exposures over a short period of time that are of importance. So, so maybe the 24-hour urines reduce variability to a certain extent but they do not really picture the actual ex real-time exposure that's taking place. It's full of peaks mm -hmm. and, and bases mm -hmm. and lows. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a hard, <coughs> that, that's a complicated question to address. For many developmental mm -hmm. abnormalities, the peak exposure is much more important than the time weighted average right. because the window of sensitivity is narrow. So you can have a time weighted average that shows no problem, but there could have been an exposure on Wednesday morning that was high mm -hmm. at a vulnerable time for that woman working in that plant, and there'll be a malformation even right. though she worked below the TLV all the time. Now, whether or not that's the case for the components of this syndrome is a little less likely in my mind because if you're looking at changes in testosterone production as the basis for them that'll fluctuate during hours during 24 hours or during critical time periods but it, it may well be a combination of a peak level that's achieved plus that overall level of exposure that's enough to, mm -hmm. to depress the testosterone so it's a little more complicated than maybe cleft palate or some other malformation for which there's a very narrow window and there's resistance away from that window. I would suspect the window here is wider than just a few hours, especially for all components of the syndrome. But very often it's just one of those or two of those components of this syndrome that are more visible than the others as well, which Any other so, bigger picture, Chris? So back to your original question, are those issues then going to be discussed, this, this window of opportunity or windows of whatever vulnerability, we, we need are to they going to be discussed yeah. in the toxicity section? We, we need to have, a, that, that's in Phil's <coughs> assignment, but yes, we, we, need to, we need to revisit that because it's, how, it's important for us to understand that, but even though we, we understand it in the Rat doesn't mean that we understand it in the human. Mm -hmm. We don't. We, we will not, when we get there, understand it to the same extent. So even though we can narrow it down to a particular morning of gestation or afternoon of gestation that's vulnerable for the rat, it doesn't mean that it'll be a, an hour or two for the human. But let's come back to that. So getting back to this complex issue of doing exposure assessment, uh, which I have to find some things more clearly for Mike and his crew is um, are we going to be looking at cumulative exposure for a woman during the entire pregnancy using you know, different cosmetics? Do, do we focus on what we suppose would be the peak <coughs> concentration that one would inhale or absorb in the skin? Um, during a vulnerable period of pregnancy uh, in terms of the 
children's toys? Do we deal with the frequency at which a child uses products that they may be able to titrate material out over a, a one-year period, a one-week period? Yeah. All those questions really provide a different set of data in terms of either the 50th, 70th, 50th, 90th percentile of exposure based upon the outcome of concern. How do, where do we have that discussion to make this real? I'm not anxious to see somebody say, well, plug in 365 day exposure to phthalates and give us an answer. They probably will give us meaningful and inform meaningless information. I, I think um, maybe the best we can do is a daily, you know, average uh, an exposure averaged over a day. Right. Um, unless we identify a specific source, like a cosmetic or something, um, and you could do some you know, pharmacokinetics or, or something like that. I think a, a, a day is probably the best, and it wouldn't be terrible. That's what I was leaning toward based upon the hazard index that they're developing, which becomes the daily hazard index, correct? Daily intake. It's based upon daily intake. So in that case, if we can, if, you know, after we think about this for the whole day, we can Agree upon that, then we don't have as many problems in terms of assessing what the data is going to look like. But the thought that you just brought up about the periodicity and the peak exposure for some part of pregnancy does, in fact, don't worry me because the daily intake does not necessarily reflect the highest level of woman's vulnerability. And how does one describe that? in an assessment. Something to think about. So do you think we might underestimate or overestimate exposure in this way? In terms of a specific effect, I think what we're talking about here is probably underestimating it, correct? <coughs> So actually, the, the spot urine samples that you know, we prefer to have 24-hour samples or longer averaging samples may actually, in some ways, be preferred because they're giving you a shorter window sure. and a snapshot of exposure and showing you more of the variability. Whereas if Ed Haynes used 24-hour urine samples, I would think the distribution would be much narrower and you know wouldn't give us that that range of possible exposures. So I think you know the spot urine samples in a way provide different and potentially in this setting more useful information. But in the example that we had with five samples having been taken over a day, one of them was high and four were low. Mm -hmm. You only have a twenty percent chance of hitting one of those that is really a concern. Right. Right. But if you have a twenty-four hour urine sample, you have a zero percent chance. Percent chance that you, you yeah, of hitting it. So. So if you have uh, you know, several thousand individuals here, yeah. you'll likely capture it. But at least one. At least one. Yeah. yeah. Well, if, if you have, if that 24 hour, it, if it's samples throughout the day, as opposed to one. Um, you don't want a composite sample. Right. Yeah, if you had if you had five individual samples mm -hmm. and analyzed them independently, so you knew that if there was one there that might look like an outlier, but it might also be the one that you're concerned about from sure. the same individual, from the individual, yeah. then you have a choice of looking at the peak or the average. Mm -hmm. well, these may seem like subtleties, but I think they are very important things to recapture as we go forward. Yeah. Chris, did you have something else? No, I was just going to point I was just going to point out that 
the value of having you know large sample sizes enough to kind of pick up. And I think that's Russ's point too, yeah. across yeah. across different kinds of exposures. Stepping back to the bigger picture of what the what we might get out of looking at the <coughs> documents that we've each produced. A couple of things, for example, that we might look at, and especially from our area where we've reviewed a lot of, of literature, the, the value of having some summary tables to go beyond just our textual description of what's out there in the literature so that people can look at in a tabular form what we consider to be the key studies and the noels that they had, the dose levels that they tested, the species, so on. Uh, enough information to dovetail again so that when somebody looks at a hazard index piece of information and it came from a particular study, they can go back and see what the conditions were in that study, maybe in a tabular form and find it pretty easily. So we, we might consider and keep in mind when you would recommend that we would have some tables to make the usefulness of the report better. And also a, a decision that's made in some reports is what kind of information to have up in the text as opposed to a more detailed description back in an appendix. And if we encounter situations where it'd be nice to have the detail, but we don't want it up there for somebody to have to plow through five pages of single space details on something while well, all they wanted was a paragraph we might keep in mind when is it appropriate to have something back in an appendix where there's a lot of detail at every amount that you want as opposed to up in the text where it would be summarized a summary of a summary kind of thing and wouldn't satisfy somebody who wants the details mm -hmm. but we don't want to have five pages of a line by line discussion of something up in the front people may not read any of them so keep that kind of thing in mind too as we go forward. Anything else on this topic before we turn to Russ? Can, can I just point out, I think this discussion has been very helpful <coughs> about talking about the importance of, of uh, properly evaluating the exposure that is the exposure, you know, across subjects, uh, uh, maybe across time or whatever, but, but <coughs> it's not just from children's toys. It's from all, all sources, and then we can go back and figure out, you know, where things may come from. But uh, I think we would, anyway, I don't want to start that again, but I think this discussion makes me feel better about you know, this idea of, a, of an overall assessment, you know, evaluating exposure, not just from certain sources. My observation, having been on a number of <coughs> advisory committees of this kind, is that generally you start out by casting the net pretty broadly for fear that you're, you're going to miss where the fish is. So you cast the net broadly, and then you narrow it down. But you, you, you give the reader the view that we, we've already looked at this area, and now we're going to focus on this one. And this might be the children's exposures, but it's in the context of what the broader net has mm -hmm. under it. If there isn't anything else on this part, let me just say what the rest of the morning might look like, because it's just about 10 o'clock. <coughs> the next thing on the agenda is to talk about the sections that Russ and Phil and I put together on the background information on, on toxicity and epidemiology. And for the animal discussion, I would like to have Phil on the phone. And we talked about bringing Phil in yeah. at 11. So if we could talk about the, start with you, Russ, and talk about the human exposure and take a break. And <coughs> by 11 o'clock, be sure that we're ready to go with, with Phil on the line. Then we can talk about the cannibal reproduction and development information until noon. Russ? Yep. That sounds fine. And, and just to clarify, this would be the epidemiology. Not, yeah. not the human exposure. Well, uh, sorry. Okay. So where is your section in this 
Um, three. I don't know, four or five. Or let's see, one, two, three, four. The fifth tab. Maybe it would be good or for six. us to take a minute and write down the numbers on all, all the tabs. Yeah. Seven, uh, sorry. To reduce seven. the uncertainty in the future. <laughs> it's, it's, it's seven. Let, let's save time in the long run. No, it's five. Right. Them now. I apologize for not having. Michael, you lead us through this so that we're for sure putting the right numbers on the right tab. Yeah, yeah, yes. The the there, there's, there's a. a uh, there, there is a table of contents in the front, oh. toward the front. Oh, there it is. Okay. <coughs> so agenda is what? Is this called summary of epidemiologic studies? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. That makes it easier. Which actually um, precedes the toxicology. So the contents is mm -hmm. uh, epidemiology should, should be five, and then it should go to animal toxicity. And, Six and seven. So. Okay. okay. So, um, I, I guess the starting big picture, what I um, tried to do here was begin to look at the epidemiologic evidence and provide summaries. I haven't included any of the data in tables yet, but in putting this together, you'll notice really the you know the first sentence um, of what I wrote is the scope and what I did as a starting point was to really restrict this to epidemiologic studies in which exposure was prenatal or during childhood and whether we define childhood to age 12 or 18. Um, so I focused for this draft on those studies. There are other studies which I you know wanted to discuss today whether it was within the charge of the committee or something that should be looked at, for instance, studies in which um, there's adult exposure and looking at endpoints um, you know, like uh, semen quality, for instance, or endometriosis. I mean, there's other studies in which the exposure was measured during the adult period, and I felt as a starting point um, not to include these and to focus on the epidemiologic literature that included the exposure windows prenatal and childhood. So um, I didn't want to do more work than was necessary until we met as a committee to agree to that approach. So I, I don't know if we want to stop and talk about that or I can, you know, go on. I, I agree. This, this is the right focus. Okay. okay. So if we're all in agreement that that re, you know reduces the literature, but I think it makes the review of the epidemiologic literature much more relevant to to what our task is. Um, and then what I've done, and I, I won't go through. I, I don't think it's necessary to go through the details of the studies, etc. You know, unless you want me to mention some of them. But um, uh, basically, broadly, they were focused on neurodevelopmental endpoints studies. Uh, by Swan, for instance, and Engel. Uh, then there were the other studies, the groups of studies on the reproductive tract development, which would include uh, anogenital distance or genital malformations. So those were really the, the two broad classes of um, endpoints that they looked at with prenatal and um, primarily prenatal, but there are some childhood studies uh, as well. Um, in writing this, I you know, try to approach it as an epidemiologist would in terms of looking at strengths and limitations of the studies, trying to um, summarize the information <coughs> qualitatively, not doing anything quantitative, and um, trying to um, prioritize in a way in which studies are stronger or weaker based on study design founders that were assessed, etc. So that's all in the report. I'd say it's probably 60 or 70 percent of the way there in terms of the literature. There are some papers that I have not included and then there would be more that I would want to um, discuss about the papers that are already there. So it's you know maybe halfway, a little over halfway there um, in, in terms of um, for the epidemiologic studies.
Um, the, the other piece of this which ties into, which probably would require a broader discussion when we get to the toxicological literature is phthalate th syndrome in rodents versus um, potentially trying to tie it to testicular dysgenesis syndrome um, in humans, the hypothesis, the TDS hypothesis. And um, I wrote a little bit about that, but very little, you know, probably a, a few sentences or so in this draft because I felt that after today, uh, discussing with, with Bill and Bernie in particular the toxicological literature, we could then come to an agreement in terms of the depth and range um, of the discussion in relation to the human data. So that's kind of a you know a three or four minute uh, overview of, of what I've done. Can go in. I don't know if you want me to go into more depths or, or take questions. Let's see what questions are. Okay. Hold it. You pointed out that you focused your study on on the prenatal phase. Is there how much data is out there, epi data, on adults or on, on as you said, effects on semen quality and so on? Can we really neglect it, or how much work would it be to compile all these relevant publications? Just just an estimate, I, I would say the, the prenatal and um, childhood exposure data probably represents a third at the most of the mm -hmm. epidemiologic data. There's you know a, a variety of studies that have you know been done looking at adult exposures and adult endpoints. I mean there. We probably don't want to completely ignore that they exist mm -hmm. in terms of the report, but then again, we don't want to, you know, the same way we were talking about, you know, kind of other co-exposures, we don't want to give it too much, um, put too much detail in because then I think it would detract from the, the focus, but potentially um, a table or a list or a few paragraphs on what's out there, if that's what you're suggesting terms of some of these other studies and why we didn't include them in the depth that we did for the prenatal and the childhood exposures because of the relevant exposure window. But that there are these studies on semen quality or endometriosis or um, even respiratory effects, you know, like, like wheeze or asthma. Or so Thank you. I'm blanking on the, the first author's name, but um, I think it was a Mount Sinai paper that talked about um, the um, temporal variability of using a spot urine. And I, <coughs> I think they referenced some of your work. Yeah, Tidal Bomb. Hi, Susan. Tidal Bomb. And we have done some work on that. Um, and Jennifer DB with myself in Columbia as well. But my, my, if I remember correctly from those papers, I mean, I got a pretty secure feeling that a spot urine was pretty reproducible from time to time in terms of if you tend to be high at one point in time, you tend to be high at other points in time. Is that? Right. So um, it, what we had done is, is looked at to see whether a spot urine sample would pr predict the category that someone would fall into right. in terms of tertile of exposure. Because as epidemiologists, a lot of times we categorize people on tertiles, quartiles, etc. And it performed pretty well. I remember right of sensitivity and specificity around 60, 70 percent. Um, in, in what I've written here, that does not include any of the exposure papers, which would include um, the Teitelbaum paper, our paper, a few, a few other papers. I think Hol some of Holger's work as well. Um, so that would be um, separate, but important part of, I think, the exposure section that I think Paul, myself, and maybe Holger was listening on. But that data does, there is some, some data, I'd say about four or five studies. What, what, once the <coughs> characterization of the phthalate syndrome became gelled enough in the rodent and rat studies, a lot of the studies that followed that was an effort to find out if this valley or that valley caused the same thing. So the, the, it 
kind of focused the endpoint on the pieces of the phthalate syndrome. A concern might be, are there other reproductive effects beyond those malformations that might be seen as part of the syndrome that are also important that we haven't looked for very hard just because we were focusing on, on the malformations that are part of the syndrome. Is there much, is there any evidence from the human studies to look at, for example, the, the impact of prenatal exposure to phthalates on the timing of uh, uh, maturity of the reproductive functions in adults or changes later on that are not occupational in relation, but from a prenatal exposure in humans. Are there other consequences that might occur that are in, in reality more important than just the elements of the symbol? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that, that those are potentially um, important endpoints to study. So I think pubertal development, um, fertility, later adult function, I think, is, is what you're asking, right? Are there studies that have looked at prenatal exposure, early life exposure in these endpoints? Well, two things that are out there that are of concern to a lot of people. One is the early onset of puberty in females, and the other one is the decrease in split account in adult right. men. And so the, the, the taking the second one first, the, the sperm count, there's been some studies we've done some and a few other groups have, but that's measuring adult exposure. Yes. Oh. So it's really cross-sectional um, yeah. data, probably missing the, the relevant exposure window if it's you know prenatal or early in childhood. In terms of um, puberty, um, there's um, two, studies that I'm aware of. There's the Kalan study that was done um, uh, in Puerto Rico probably about seven or eight years ago. It's a small study. Um, there's quite a few limitations in the study ranging from the way they measured the exposure, they measured the diester, to the selection of the control girls. But they, they looked at telarchy, basically early breast development. Um, <coughs> My, I, it's not included in what I wrote, but basically, um, and can be, they looked at you know, ba basically very pre precocious breast development in girls that were you know, three or four or five years of age, because Puerto Rico apparently has um, an outbreak or um, uh, high incidence of premature thelarchy. Um, and so that's one of the puberty studies, and the other one uh, is very small, also not in here. Um, I think the author is Bahrain, or it, they looked at um, children, it was very small, I think 20 or 30 children um, that they assessed their pubertal status, I think when they were, let's say, between just estimating 14 and 20 or so, to look for uh, delay in puberty and these were children that were in intensive care units and basically received, I think, if I'm remembering right, ECMO and you know other procedures that would have exposed them to high levels of DEHP during um, neonatal uh, life um, when they were in the NICUs. And the study, um, you know, concluded really that they did not see a difference as compared to, a, if I remember right, 20 or so control children, but it's a very small study. Um, the assessment of exposure was really NICU or not, um, but those are the only two pubertal studies, you know, basically going later in life um, that I'm aware of. So the data is very limited. Yeah. I'd like to follow on uh, the line of argumentation with which Bernie opened, uh, the theme being linking it to evidence of a phthalate syndrome in animals. And part of that, as we all know, is um, suppression of fetal angiogenesis. synthesis. That's been observed in, in animal studies. But um, there's also some epidemiological evidence that there might be something to it. There are also some studies in the occupational arena. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of these. Would you think it would be worthy including those? 
So there are some uh, look where uh, serum-free testosterone levels were measured, or the um, LH-free testosterone ratio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but varying success, of course. So I, I think you're referring to two groups of studies. One in one is done in adults, where you're measuring phthalates and then looking at reproductive hormone profiles, right? That's so right. some of the occupational settings. That's right. Um, so that's an adult exposure. Um, it could <coughs> provide insights for earlier life exposures. There's a few studies, I know there's the main study, yeah. where they, they did look at, um, I think it was levels of breast milk, it's actually not in, included in here yet, um, and looked at, um, I think it was TLH ratios, yeah. testosterone yeah. Um, LH ratios. So that should be definitely included. Whether we, I, th I think we should definitely mention the adult exposure studies, but again, the same way we would treat some of the other endpoints like semen quality where there's only adult assessment of exposure, we would mention that they exist, that they either are consistent with maybe what has been seen in the main study or not. Um, but I wouldn't go into a lot of detail unless after <coughs> discussions today we, we felt it was necessary. You, you know, a lot of a lot of people cite the the Cologne study um, and uh, the main study, even Bornhog, you know, the asthma. Yeah. So, you know, I I think uh, they need to be mentioned. And, uh, and as far as the uh, adult exposures go, um, the, uh, <clears throat> I mean, even the animals, the adults are sen sensitive. They're just way, they're less sensitive than neonatal, prenatal. But um, if, you know, so if there's an effect in the adult studies, um, it's not necessarily reflecting just early life exposures. I mean, there could be effects in adults too. Sure. Effects from exposure as an adult. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And through a different mechanism than the in utero. Well, I think it's, it, 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 it may be a, you know, inhibition of testosterone, but the adults aren't immune, they're just less sensitive. Mm -hmm. so, so I think what you're suggesting is, you know, to include it in the report at some level of yeah, detail. I mean it's not the fo you know obviously we're zeroing in on the um, phthalate syndrome, but I wouldn't want to ignore those, and especially because the the endpoint is relevant. Yeah. Whereas if we were looking at another adult exposure and a non-reproductive endpoint, it's much less relevant to the report. Yeah. But again, I would be very careful interpreting the Cologne data, at least this one. This yes. is, I would just mention it, but really say that it's very unreliable in terms of exposure assessment measurement of parent mm -hmm. uh, phthalate. Yeah. But as you said, it's an important endpoint, and a lot of people know and cite this study still. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think at, at the time people were thinking it was. Uh, uh, an estrogen, phthalates were estrogenic as opposed to anti-androgenic, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, I, I agree. I would definitely mention it. And you know, back in 2005, when I wrote a review with Antonio Califat, we included it in the report, but, you know, basically didn't really give it very much weight because of what you're saying, Homer. But we need to recognize it. <coughs> Another point about what you wrote and about what we are writing later on too. You make the distinction between low molecular weight and high molecular weight phthalates. What do you consider as low molecular and what do you consider as high molecular weight phthalates? Well, just to clarify, um, I, I don't use the categorization, at least in, in my work, the low and high. This is. It, it's in the report and it's been used by several groups. Um, the low molecular weight um, basically, and I, I wrote in the report here, is really driven by MEP. I mean, that 
you know, basically, if you use low molecular weight or MEP, you probably get the same statistical association because it's such a um, big driver of the low molecular weight phthalates. And, um, and then, you know, the, the other ones would be the high molecular weight, which again, and I've put in the report, are really driven by the DEHP metabolites. So do we have a consensus among us that DHP is a high molecular weight phthalate? You know, I think some people call it a transitional. That in fact, we, uh, we, we just got a submission on, um, on that, related to that. I think, I, I'm not sure the different definitions are 100% in agreement, I think. If we're going to use, if you're going to use that terminology in the report, um, we might, you know, that might be one of those things where we decide, you know, this is what uh, DEHP is in this category or, or that. Hmm. Yeah, and, and just to be more specific, Holger, uh, for the low molecular weight, this is for the Mount Sinai study, they. MMP, MEP, MBP, and MIBP, that were the low. Yeah. At least the way they classified them for their analysis. And, and, and of course the, the metabolites are, the oxidized metabolites are very confusing. So <laughs> I, we definitely have to agree on a, a way to describe them. But that, that's for you, you to decide. Can I uh, ask, can ask your, your learned opinion about, about uh, what I see as a, as a bit of a conundrum and it vexed me a little, and that is, uh, it relates to the um, low molecular weight, high molecular weight. From animal studies we know that uh, there are structure activity relationships and it appears that phthalates with an ester side chain of between C4 and C6 induce the phthalate syndrome and uh, low molecular weight phthalates such as DEP, for example, fail to induce this effect. Yet, on the other hand, there are um, indications uh, that in humans, the low molecular weight uh, phthalates may not be, let's phrase it like this, <coughs> without risk or without effect. There's, for example, uh, one uh, study among hair sprayers that's been carried out in Europe, they found associations with um, Abstadias and cryptorchidism, if I remember correctly, and there are more recent studies pointing in, in similar directions. How do we, how do you interpret this? It's a, a difficult, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, a difficult um, issue. Um, uh, let me explain. I mean, you, you said that the, the, the exposure, say, among hairdressers is more <coughs> likely uh, to, to DEP. But that's a mixture exposure, right? Yeah. Those those papers they didn't assess specific chemicals are exposed to DEP as well as other chemicals. So it could be the DEP, it could be something else mm -hmm. that they're exposed to, or or it could be lifestyle differences, etc. You know, depending mm -hmm. on the comparison group, etc. Yeah. Um, but you, you're probably referring, you know, specifically to like the Swan paper where they found associations, right, with AGD. And yeah, MEP, yeah. and yeah. then also some of the neurodevelopmental um, studies as well. Yeah, that's um, uh, the first author's Ormond in Imperial College London. They did this study yeah. among addresses. Yeah, that there are others. Uh, now recently, have other studies have appeared. Yeah. Um, so I, I think what you're asking is my interpretation. Um, it could be one of two, or at least two, two um, explanations that in humans, MEP is associated potentially with some of these endpoints, or MEP could be a surrogate marker for another exposure or a lifestyle characteristic. So depending on how well done the study is, the comparison group or controls are chosen, confounders measured, um, you know, it could be users of DEP differ in different respects. 
that impart risk, or it could be the DEP itself that's imparting risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in epidemiology, we always like to see replication. So if we sure. if we do see it in different cohorts or studies, then we we tend to think the association is is real. Yeah, I'm, I'm referring specifically to the work by Ormond et al. That's among um, hairdressers. Um, that's in EHP. That's in EHP, yeah. Right. And then more recently, paper by Giordano, that's a Dutch group. They used, is it Dutch? I don't know. They used um, job exposure mm -hmm. matrices to, to classify jobs in terms of likely EDC exposure. And what they found was an increase in likelihood of hypospadia when mothers were engaged in jobs with exposure to phthalates, alkyl phenols, <coughs> biphenolic compounds, etc. So mm -hmm. it's that this kind of evidence, I totally take your point. In all these studies, uh, there were no attempts made to really measure DEP, but there are hints in this direction. Maybe we should, uh, we should consider this critically. Yeah, I think they, they, they should be included. I, can, I think the Ormond, I think I'm familiar with the other one or not, but included um, as part of the report, but probably as a second level of evidence because of the non-specificity yeah. of the exposure. But that would be, you know, I'd clearly point that out, that this is what yeah. they found, but there are potential other explanations. And I think Swan or somebody suggested correlations um, among the different phthalates that we're exposed to might explain that. So I don't know if there's anything from NHANES that would suggest that, you know, people who are exposed to one phthalate are also exposed to another. <coughs> um, that might be something to look, to consider. I'm just trying to figure out how this is a whole bunch of things that are being added on to what you start out to be as a very direct and concise statement as to what studies relate to where we're heading. And it seems like it's almost like you have a tiered set of uh, studies to work with, ones which are really directly relevant, ones which may have a little bit more have some quasi relevancy because of the endpoints, and others which are on the margin. Maybe if you, you know, focus on the ones that you've done, the key ones first. I, I think that's yeah. that's the most important, mm -hmm. and the rest of it, if you can put it yeah. in a, a, a summary of maybe the table, would be easier of other things that may be of importance. Yeah. That might work out best. But focus on your main stuff main studies first because I thought that was very well done. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Thanks. And I, 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 I agree. And I started really with the ones that I thought were the strongest mm -hmm. studies, the most relevant yeah. studies. But then to bring in, you know, the other ones which, um, you know, for instance, if there was papers in which they measured DEP metabolite, MEP in urine, associated with hypospadias, and then you have one or two hairdresser studies, it, it lends some support to the, right. the study that has the biomarker in it. Um, but like you said, I mean, a tiered approach, really um, focusing on the, the stronger studies, relevant windows, uh, specificity of exposure, but then also bringing in the other ones, which I was going to do secondarily. I could definitely be talked down from this, but is it important to also <coughs> include um, some overall sense of how common these outcomes are without any link necessarily to phthalates? Um, I don't know. So, um, do you mean kind of um, background information, really? I mean, I'm thinking of um, the IOM reports, you know, like I'm actually on the, the Vietnam Veterans and Agent Orange Committee now where, you know, each health outcome will start with a paragraph or two about you know, the prevalence or incidence of this condition or, or disease. That, um, I don't know. I, yeah. 
I mean, some of them are endpoints for which that data doesn't exist. So for instance, the AGD, which is really an anatomical marker um, and a range, there's, there's not population data. For some of the neurodevelopmental endpoints, there's some of that data, and I, I did in the report a little bit more in trying to put it in perspective in terms of whether it's clinically relevant endpoint or sometimes with these you know sensitive survey instruments you're really looking at changes in kind of population means rather than moving the child into a clinically relevant endpoint so for instance um, uh, symptoms that that are uh, part of the ADHD but the child would not be really classified as having ADHD even though on the evaluation they may have some of those characteristics so for some of the endpoints I think it could be done for others it would be um, more difficult and definitely um, would want not want to be misleading you know, in terms of that you know let's say the Swan and Angle studies are looking at some of these subtle changes not implying that these children have ADHD or, or have any other psychological disorders. I say, I say that because uh, uh, at the EPA workshop on phthalates uh, back in December, the, I can't remember the woman's name, but the, the epidemiologist presented and I think she said 3% of males have, or maybe in the United States, have unascended testes, which was kind of striking to me. I had no idea. Yeah, it's probably, well, it depends at what age. At, at birth, maybe it's 3% because a, a large proportion will descend, but it's probably around, somewhere around 1%. But, um, yeah. So yeah. But, um, I, and, and that's something we, we can consider as, as I put this together more, whether there would be a paragraph or two in the beginning of each health endpoint for which it's relevant to put it in perspective. And I don't mean to add more work, it's, uh, and I don't know that you know the committee would agree that it needs to be there. It was just interesting. Mm -hmm. my <clears throat> well, it has to do with ease of detecting an effect of another agent. Because if it's at the 1% or 10% level, there's a difference in being able to detect the effect of any environmental agent compared to if it's 50%. In the background, so I think it's a relevant addition for the the endpoints. Just that's relevant for yeah. yeah. That there's yeah. there's there's that data. Yeah. Well, look, cryptorchidism and hypospadia is. I mean, there's people. There's registry data. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Must be. Yeah. CDC data. Russ, I want to come back just for a minute to a variation, perhaps, of my earlier question. In some cases, we have an observation in humans, and it drives a whole bunch of animal work to try to find out if it's feasible for that particular exposure or the levels of exposure. But in this case, my understanding would be that the animal findings have driven the question, is this happening in humans? And the, one of the impacts of that is that it narrows the search to those endpoints that we've seen in the rat for the phthalate syndrome. As an epidemiologist and a physician, do you have any concern that the question isn't broad enough in humans? That there may be concern from phthalate exposure that has concern beyond the phthalate syndrome, and we're not looking for it. I mean, it's a it's a theoretical question. Just wondering if there's a surprise out there waiting for us. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I agree you know, with that p potential concern. I, I think um, more recently the phthalate research in humans has, has expanded you know, more broadly in terms of endpoints that are um, apart from anti-androgenic effects. You know, there's a lot of Bornhags doing a lot on the respiratory, 
Um, there's um, other studies that have looked at um, you know, uh, body mass index, etc. You know, Hatch and others have done that. That's using NHANES data, using you know adult exposure levels. So I think in the beginning it was probably relatively narrow, but I think more recently it's expanded. I sometimes have you know the the other concern is that you know sometimes people have data sets where they may have endpoints that um, biologically may not at least from the animal data be relevant in terms of phthalate exposure or whatever the exposure may be and then they you know look for associations and, and they don't really are not able to tie it to a mechanism or underlying toxicity data but I think for the um, at least where the phthalate research is now I think it's it's been broadened um, to that point and you know sometimes it, it may be too broad, but um, I think it's. Yeah, and I'm not raising this to recommend that we change the scope of what yeah. we're worried about in humans. Uh, it's just whether or not there's a surprise out there that might become evident by the time we get the report done. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the biggest difficulty with the human studies is looking at prenatal or childhood exposure and trying to look <coughs> at adult endpoints right. just because yeah. of the, the, the time frame. So if they're was a potential surprise. That's that's where I think it would be. Whether, as epidemiologists, we'd be able to design such a study where we can characterize exposure during pregnancy and then look at that child's fertility, let's say when they're an adult, or look at um, you know risk of adult disease is difficult to you know near near impossible um, with the exposure techniques we have where we can't look you know, retrospectively. Yeah. So that that's where I would think. Um, Cross-sectionally, I, I think the range is, is fairly wide in terms of the organ systems that are looking at, whether it's pulmonary, reproductive, um, you know, some of the metabolic endpoints have been looked at. But I really think it's the, the latency of the later life effects for which we lack data and, and probably will continue to lack data. And that's limitation for any exposure, yeah. not just phthalates. Well, yeah. especially for phthalates with the short, short lasts, the, the exposures with short half-lives. For some of the other ones with, you know, much longer half-lives, yes. you can get a, not a perfect handle on it. You know, for dioxins, for instance, may have half-lives in years or decades. Yeah. Paul, were you going to? No, I totally agree. I, I think your point's well taken, but um, we just can't look. At the light under the lamppost for some of these things, we have to be really <coughs> critical about saying that that syndrome may, in fact, work in humans, but it may not be the only one. Just in a recent example in air pollution is PM. For <coughs> 50 years, we thought PM was primarily associated with lung disease. In the last 10 to 15 years, we realized that with the elderly, which is a group that's more sensitive and they have. Uh, less ability to cope with with PM, it's cardiovascular endpoints that are a major concern. And is it a lifetime accumulation, or is it the peaks that lead to the severity of the effects? We're only beginning to understand that mechanism, whereas before we were we were not quite looking at that as being a major point of concern. So I think your point's well taken that we just cannot look like we just cannot let people say. But this is where we should end our investigation. Yeah, no, I, I agree uh, completely. And, and I think it, it kind of ties in a little bit with it, with what Andreas was saying. You know, sometimes it's kind of a, a different um, different level, or it, it's different, but where you um, use the animal data you're saying to kind of drive the endpoints, but using it to drive which phthalates you think would be relevant right. and Andrea's question was well the animal data you don't see these effects with DEP but you do in a limited number of epi studies so then what do you do with that data and then how do you use it potentially you know in a in a risk assessment it's you're not you're not seeing it in the animals but you are in a limited subset of human studies how do you use it so it's I guess my feeling has always been if I see it in human studies, I bring a 
go out and do some more studies and aggressively deal with it because of the fact that there are these possibilities that the effects in animals and the effects in humans are not always transferable. Yeah. And I think that's something we have to seriously think about. Uh, again, going back to PM research, a lot of our research that the standard was based on for cardiovascular was based upon not on mechanistic studies in animals, but basically on based upon the epidemiology, which drove the process for quite a few years until people began to do the mechanistically based studies to try to address the issue of why it's happening. Because it was done at concentrations which are much lower than are normally at seen in traditional toxicology studies. So Again, it's, uh, if there is a something that I would recommend is if we see stuff that is going on in humans, I think that the first thing to do is to say we need more tox and we need more human studies to, to validate this since it is much most relevant to our human condition. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And then the, the dosing in humans is very different than what's done in tox studies. You know, it's basically you know, episodic. Yeah. Um, but continuous, in, you know, in a way, which is different than in a talk study, so it potentially could account for for some differences in in effects that you see. Okay. Any other comments for Russ? Chris. Sorry, Russ. <laughs> I have to keep piling on. So I'm, I was just looking at some of what you wrote here, and uh, I this little paragraph about um, which the, page. Sorry, uh, page three. Yeah. You're talking about the phthalate score. The, yeah. So you're actually addressing the issue of, um, you know, a combination effect of these phthalates. Uh, and I think you have something about that the odds ratios were stronger for. I thought I saw that for the summary score than for the uh, individuals. Yes. So one question is, in your reviewing of the papers. Do you see people addressing the summary scores or something about a combination effect? Um, which makes me think, you know, just to point out, when they do that, I think it might be interesting to see. We may be underestimating what the potential effect could be if we just look at one chemical at a time. Um, yeah, so it's it, a few studies have, well, the SWAN has used this, the summary score. Um, the, the Wolf papers use kind of the sum of the low and molecular weight and then the, some of the high molecular weights as, in a way, a, uh, a summary. So it has, um, it has been used a, <coughs> in a few studies, but not a lot. And, and where it has been used, I've pointed it out. I haven't very explicitly tied it then to basically a cumulative risk assessment or a way of looking at Additivity. I've really presented what they've done and how they've used it, but I could interpret it further, or or you could when you use it. You know, if you wanted to for you, for your section as well, or we can have a kind of a back and forth in terms of making sure it's consistent. Is is the level of detail here? I mean, it was fairly. Detailed, you know, was I don't know, maybe six or eight papers I've gone through already um, at the level that we were expecting for these reports because I really didn't have a guide in terms of, you know, sometimes like IOM committees, you may have a paragraph on a paper. Here I spend, you know, several paragraphs or a page or two sometimes on a paper to go into detail. And then, of course, the, the synthesis, which is most important. Just get a sense of if the level of detail is, is where we were expecting it or not, or, or as the day goes on, we can kind of compare across sections. I was just going to raise that, too, because the <coughs> level of detail that Phil and I went into for the animal studies is much less. Mm. Our, ours is much more of a brief summary. And at least my conclusion, Russ, is that the level of detail that you have in here is warranted. And it, it's appropriate. It's not like reading the manuscript, but it's more than reading just a, an abstract. So I'm comfortable with the level of detail that you have in this. And as you add more information to it, to proceed with that same level of detail, especially for the key studies. 
Okay. Just, just wanted to be sure before I did too much or too little work. So. Well, what about the rest of you? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm comfortable with that level of detail. Okay. Well, but, but still, but still thinking about from the tiering point of view for the more important studies, the less important studies you don't need to go into. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. <coughs> And in terms of, um, you know, I, I think Mike was saying it's about a, a year from now or so when the, the report is due to the CPSC, right? Um, in terms of cutoff for literature, because there are papers that continually come out, you know, would we make a deadline of, you know, August or October, or when would we want to, or later? Um, you know, there's there's not a lot that comes out, but there are new papers on the horizon that I I know will be coming out in the next few months or in the fall. Good question. Do we, do we try to retro, retrofit them in, or can we have a page that says papers, key papers published, important papers published, too late? In effect. Well, I you know I think that that's a it's a judgment. We can wait a little while before we set a cutoff date, but it also depends on the study. If it's significant yeah. or, or it might have an impact, we might, uh, you know, tolerate a, a, a later deadline. But I, I think we should agree on a, on a cutoff date for everything. It's relevant not only right for to your yes. study, but shall we say September 2011? Well, that's one, that's one meeting after we've had a chance to look at everything. That's true. So I think that's a good time. Mm. Because we're not, I mean, we're, we're several months from the end, but by that time, if there is a study that comes out that impacts our conclusions, we need, I think we need to deal with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I, I like September as a time that we're all shooting for that we're going to capture relevant papers until September. And from then on, it's a judgment. Kind of as a provisional popcorn. Yeah. yeah. Is that reasonable? Of course, you might finish early. Well, we, <laughs> so we'll adjust it. <laughs> August 30th. Such optimism. <laughs> OK, anything else from Russ? That was a good discussion, Russ. Thank you. And if there are other papers, you know, like Andreas, you mentioned a few, or others that, that you know of, yeah, um, because that, that that's the another question that I that I had. You know, my experience, let's say, being on IOM committees, they'll they'll do these extensive literature searches, etc., and you weed through, you know, thousands of abstracts. Um, we pretty much within our own areas, we kind of know the studies, but there's the possibility that I don't, or, or definitely don't know all of them. Um, is there kind of a um, formal mechanism or way in which we just should describe how we identified these studies? Is that something that would be done mm -hmm. up front or at, at the back, or, or how are we going to... Identif identifying the kind of the universe of the the studies that are there. I mean, I could do searches. And I mean, it's 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 up to the panel. We I I just received an updated literature search that I, I will send to all of you. Um, <coughs> we search. We're limited to Medline, Toxline. Um, <coughs> you know, it's up to the panel. If you want to uh, go go beyond that, or, or how you want to deal with that, in my experience, it's good to do that to say to to make precise statements about search strategy, etc., cut off dates, yeah. and the like. Makes it more transparent for everyone. This is good for us as well. Let's. Will you bring that question back after we're a little bit further through the rest of the speakers, because then it will have to be additional to the dimensions. But it's an important question. Bring it. Bring it back. Okay. Are we ready to take a break?
and order yeah. lunch. But let's let's reconvene in 15 minutes. Tell them you're ready. Okay. Phil, this is Mike Babbage. Hi, Mike. Uh, we're we're all here, and we're ready to begin the discussion on uh, on animal toxicity. Okay. So I'll turn the meeting okay. over to <clears throat> Burn. Morning, Phil. Morning, Burn. Well, the first thing is to find out if you can hear us as we talk to you from around the table. Russ, will you say good morning? So, Pete. Good morning, Phil. Hey, Russ. Okay, can you hear us okay? Phil? What? Can you hear us okay? <laughs> uh, yes, just barely. Just barely. <clears throat> well, well, we'll do our best to speak loud enough so that you can hear us. Okay. And if, and if you lose us, speak up quickly. All right. We have gone through the earlier discussion about the seven questions, and we've gone through the discussion of the contribution of Russ on the epidemiology data, and that was a very helpful discussion about the epidemiology data, but also questions of format and content and so on. <clears throat> so I'm not sure that we need to go through some of those things again, but we need to talk about them specifically as they apply to the contributions that you and I have put together. So, <clears throat> the, for example, the group endorsed that the level of detail that Phil has, or that Russ has gone into for the epidemiology studies is appropriate for the epidemiology studies and the importance of them to the overall contribution of the report. But that, the, I think the same question is still there for the section that you and I wrote, the sections <coughs> that you and I wrote. So we are, again, we're not going through this line by line, but we're, we're trying to find out for sure if there's enough information in our sections to support the discussion of the hazard index evaluations and the other components that, that go with this that we have to connect to. So okay. we're, up, we're up to the contribution of you and me, and you're welcome to start first, or I will. Your choice. Uh, why don't you go and I will just follow the discussion and go second. Okay. So I was assigned the, the task of reviewing the developmental toxicology part of it, but I started out with some broader information that may not necessarily be best to leave right here where it is, and it may be better replaced with some, it, it, by somebody else's <coughs> writings, so it may well be best, for example, to talk about the, this isn't the best place to have the discussion about what were the permanent bands and the, the interim band chemicals. But I, I did that here to make sure that <coughs> at least I had a list to work from of the chemicals that I would include in my part. And I, I think we need to have that in an earlier stage of the report so that we all know what are the chemicals that we are looking at. So Mike, I, was, I would ask for someone, com coming back to something we talked about earlier this morning, I would come back to that and ask if you could have somebody put together a list of the chemicals that is the kind of the official list for all of us. And then I can take this out of here. But then when I went through the, this, the section on the reproductive toxicity of these, one of the things that existed <coughs> on these chemicals, on many of these chemicals, but not all, was a review by an NTP component known as the Center for Evaluation of Human Health Risks, Human Reproductive Risks. And this was 
an advisory committee that met under the umbrella of the National Toxicology Program and NIEHS to review chemicals that have been nominated by the public for review for reproductive health endpoints. So they reviewed many of the phthalates as a group, many of the more visible ones, the ones that for which there was a lot of information. And they wrote a series of reports dating from the what the late 90s until 2006. So one of the things that I've done in my in my review is that every time there was a CERHR report, I used that rather than plow the same ground all over again by myself. I referenced the information that was in that report and their recommendations so that there wasn't a question of me paraphrasing what the recommendations were from the CERHR and then in the process of them doing their job, the next step after they have written a report is that the National Toxicology Program asked its board of scientific counselors <coughs> to comment on the recommendations, the conclusions of the CERHR. So that becomes a, a non-regulatory comment because the NTP doesn't have any regulatory authority, but this is another level of review of the CERHR recommendations that I thought was worth quoting. Generally, the NTP was in agreement with what the CERHR recommended, but not always. Not always in the same strength. So what I did then was to review these chemicals and paraphrase what was in the CERHR report and then the literature reviews that have been provided to us had <coughs> studies that were reported since the CERHR report was written in today. So then I separated those out and reviewed those by myself without the benefit of another review group. So that makes it that makes mine a little bit different than Russ where there was no you didn't use the CERHR reports in the same way that I did. But my question of you as a group is whether you think it is uh, satisfactory to use the reviews that have already been done by that body, and there's only one of those bodies out there. I didn't go to IARC or any other group for their comments, because this is the most targeted group specific for reproductive effects in animals and humans. So is that an adequate approach, or does that make this report of the animal reproductive studies too difficult to, to look at? Andres. I, I think, all right, I'm on now. I think, uh, I think this is uh, very well done and very appropriate, and also I feel it doesn't uh, contradict the um, brief in the law, the charge, which says that we should conduct our <coughs> examinations de novo. It means we can rely on previous reviews, but they shouldn't be determinative, and I don't think that's the case here. And other than that, it's, it's just common sense, I would think. Um, it's very well done. I'm fully in support of that. OK, thank you, Andres. I'm not going to go through this chemical by chemical, but what I want to know, particularly of those of you who are working on the hazard index, is the information that's in here sufficient to help dovetail into what you're doing, or are there pieces that I need to, to pull out yet and put in here? I may not have captured every noel that the authors talked about in their in their manuscripts or in, in the earlier reviews. I can go back and make that complete. But what what do you need other than the noel then to help you where for example, where do you get the point of, depart of departure? And is that something that I need to pull out of here different from the Noel? Well, if you remember, we have two cases that we're looking at. And one case is largely drawn from 
the Court and Champion Faust 2010 paper. And I think many of those uh, reference doses were based on some NHANES or some uh, 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 American studies, but largely European studies. Am I correct about that, Andreas? You, you are, yeah. So, um, we, we, we are Europeans. <laughs> Um, and then, and then the other assumptions that we're making are are based on some work of Earl Graham. I'm, I haven't looked at this close enough to know um, if you're reflecting. Earl's in there. Yeah, I see a lot of grays, but yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> so I mean, so are you saying that maybe it would be helpful to actually construct a table that would? Sort of bring it all together. I've in terms concluded of already in a discussion that I had earlier with, with Mike and Phil <clears throat> that for sure I need to have some tables in here that summarize it. Otherwise, it's just text and it's not very interesting to read all that much text about studies after studies after studies. So, yes, I, I will prepare some tables and it would be helpful for me to know. I don't want to prepare a table that summarizes every study that's summarized in here. I, I need to know what would be the critical entries in that table, chemical-wise, mm -hmm. and what data do I need to have in the table that allows people to go from your section right. to mine, or from mine to yours, and the information is complementary. And then I'll put those tables together, and Bell will do the same. So it comes down to which, which studies did you use? Well, so again, I mean, um, if, if you look at the uh, uh, the court camp and Faust uh, paper, yeah. I, I think it's very specific. There are a lot of references there, you know, to this Noel came from here, or this was a, BM, a benchmark dose, you know, lower limit or whatever. Um, so, are you saying that the that the direction of your chapter could be to actually get to the point of all of these studies now from that body of literature? What do we think is a good reference dose yeah. suggested from <coughs> Yes. Well, one of the criteria for considering an animal study to be a key study is whether or not it contributes data to go beyond that study. And if, if for example, they don't calculate or they have uncertainty about a NOAL, it may be an important study to report, but it's not a key study. So <coughs> I, I will make the cut based on some of the animal findings as well. Some of, the, uh, some of the studies are just plain poorly designed to, to look at those response, or even the breadth of the endpoints, or maybe the right days of exposure. So even though they might be in there, they may not be key studies for some of those reasons. But what I, what I want to be able to do is have people easily crosswalk from our two sections and not wonder why you didn't do this or not right. wonder why I didn't include that. One thing that might be helpful is is to look at either the court camp paper or our little report um, and just start from, okay, these are the no, the no ALs or the reference doses, whatever, that we're yeah. using. Do you see anything, any reason why these aren't the right, you know? I'll, are I'll, there? I can do that. That's, that's the help I was looking for. Could, could I add to that? There, there's a lot of studies out there that provide um, <coughs> dose response information, but often in terms of um, numbers of animals per dose group used, um, there, there would be question marks basing any any points of departure or no else or benchmark doses on those. Um, would it be possible to highlight that or to, or to, to give your opinion, are you of the opinion that this and that study is suitable to derive points of departure? Okay. That would help the hazard index story a lot. I can do that informally. It doesn't mean it would be part of the report, but I, I can do that to make just as a way of checking to be sure that we're on the same page. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering why, why not also start Well, it could be report. Yeah. Sure. It makes it transparent. Yeah. There, this leads me on to uh, a related point. Uh, there's often studies reported uh, where they fail to see any effect. And I would think in particular in those cases we need to be developing a sense of um, power. Was the power of the study sufficient to, to be rather confident? And could that information also be added? 
in, in particular with those studies, so information about number of animals per dose group, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's another <coughs> variable in these studies, and that is how the how the chemicals were actually <coughs> given. Yeah. In some cases, sure. they're given by gabage, right. and that's usually a short-term study. <coughs> and a, if there's a repeated exposure over several months, there are some labs that mix the chemical in with the feed, and they give that same concentration throughout the whole study. So then the dose keeps changing every day. And there are other labs that every time they weigh the animals, like at least once a month, if not once a week, they readjust the concentration in the diet to provide the same number of milligrams per kilogram per day throughout the study. So there, if you pick a time, I mean the doses, when they just add it in the diet and give it as a fixed concentration throughout a multi-generation reproductive study, the actual dose in milligrams per kilogram <coughs> per day might vary as much as twofold. So what time do you pick then? Do you pick the time during lactation? Or do you pick the time when they're in the first 90 days, 60 days of the study? Or do you pick during mating? What what days do you <coughs> pick to, to express the dose? And that's something over which the toxicology community has never gotten control. Some labs want to do it one way, other labs do it a different way. It's a lot more work to adjust it every time you weigh them. But it makes the data make much more meaningful. So there are some of these key studies that are in any one of those three categories. And I, I need, somehow, <clears throat> you need to be alert that when, when I say that the animal's got 913 milligrams per kilogram per day, you have to ask me more for more information than that in order to know what vari what, how much variation that really had in the study. If we, if we threw out all the studies that didn't change the concentration on a weekly basis, there this, this left the remaining ones would be a small group. That's right. So let me see if I can get my understanding. You have Andreas's paper in which you took most of your information on the dose per day to animals and then translated that to a human. I'm trying to understand. You didn't use the full body of literature. You took the summary from his paper. Right. Yeah, yeah, but why are we discussing this now? We're discussing the... Well, I'm trying to understand, oh, yeah. the, I'm just trying to understand <coughs> the basis for their work and whether or not they're including the body of evidence that... So why do we bother talking about all these other studies in, in one way when we're focusing on this, your work? for the basis of the hazard assessment. I'm trying to focus my attention to what, are, again, our purpose is with respect to development of the hazard assessment. Not, not to discount the work that's been done, because I think it was fabulous. It's just that now I don't understand how the two connect. Do you see my point? There, there's got to be a point of connection of why we summarize all these studies, but we're focusing on X. There seems to be no rationale for that at this point. Uh, at, least yes, at least no rationale yeah. explained in the... the There's two, two levels. Uh, the the uh, study summarized by, by Phil and Bernd right. um, <coughs> for kind of inspecting them and knowing the literature myself a little in two broad categories. Number one, uh, studies which are good enough, for example, to answer questions, does this and that phthalate induce features, parts of the phthalate syndrome or yeah. not? But these studies are, uh, because of the de their design and intention, often not suitable to derive any estimates for so-called safe exposures in the human from. So they would not be sufficient for what we call points of departure. Okay. On the other hand, there are other studies that, which are, in terms of their design, their intention, the number of animals they use for per dose group, and the number of doses they examined, well suited for such purpose. So. And what this discussion was about, and what I think that was Chris's point, was to separate this out because that would help later on 
with a discussion for risk assessment, hazard index, etc., to have markers put in here in examining the animal evidence, which say, okay, that study is suitable for deriving a point of departure, but that isn't, etc. Or when there's lack of evidence, uh, this is, for example, what uh, uh, Michael Faust and myself did in this paper. Um, <coughs> Often there is no other evidence. There are some studies that would allow you to make some assumptions or estimates about mm -hmm. points of departures, but because the number of animals used was too small, then that has an impact on the choice of uncertainty factor. So this kind of information would be really helpful and could then be taken up later in the risk assessment chapter. What you just yeah. said is not That's captured. It's not captured in what we've written. There's no preamble to say why. Yeah. And but that, that's really necessary yeah. because when I go from here to there, I find no connection. Yeah, but that's and, and we're here to discuss these things. Well, that could easily be included. And to me, that's a very important. Mm -hmm. What you just said now is a very important thing to put in yeah. right in the beginning because then everybody gets a real contextual yeah. framework from which to operate yeah. from in terms of understanding why all these reviews are occurring and why you were able to select what you did to do the next step. That's good. The data or the endpoints are as relevant for you as they are relevant for us. Oh yeah, I totally agree. So uh, we should all agree on this approach and as Bernard said, most of the studies are very heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you have to find a common approach to distill the TDIs or the ADIs or the reference dose, however you might call them, out of it. And we all have to be aware that in our approach, the reference doses we name are not the reference doses of the US EPA. So these are our reference doses right. we distilled from, from various studies. Uh, and that's why we also use the case two approach, which is from Earl Gray's work, which has the advantage that it is based on the same study protocol for almost all of the substances, but has the drawback that it's not designed really to distill a, a no effect level out of it. So we we might have to discuss also with your knowledge, Bert, uh, if our case two approach is valid, if we can distill it out of the data Earl Grey presented at the second chat meeting if this is a valid alternative to approach. So we might discuss that too. Yeah. <coughs> Good. And I feel more, again, because it's such yeah. a great, yeah, yeah. A great analysis. Good point. Yeah. They, they have to be comfortable. Mm. Yeah. In the end, you m should be able to jump from your chapter to our chapter to your chapter, and it should be the same right. endpoints yeah. and the yeah. same yeah. point of departure. <coughs> But again, for completeness, to, to suggest to the reader that we did a complete job of reviewing and that the papers that we cite or the data that we select for doing a more extensive evaluation wasn't just the first 10 papers we read. Right. We, 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 read the, we read them all. But there may be 10 papers out of there that were the basis for the calculations that we made. But th th these comments are very helpful to me. I'll, I'll follow up with a table that does what you, hopefully that you're looking for. And the text that describes this distinction between what one study provides versus another one versus another one. Yeah. For this overall process. That, that, that should be in there. And, and it may also be helpful that when there's a some discrepancy potentially, you know, for one or more chemicals where you're not quite sure if, if a region, yeah. you know, one value is the right reference dose. I mean, we can do <coughs> sensitivity analyses in, in our work. Um, I think largely, w which will show, it doesn't matter too much. We, we're not really, we don't need to split hit hairs. You know, is it 30 or 40? It doesn't probably really matter. Is it 100 or 1,000? Maybe that would matter. But, you know, at some point, we don't need to, yeah. be too fine-tuned about it. The other thing I might um, sort of point out, it seems to me we're, we're kind of thinking about, um, you know, biomonitoring data for uh, pregnant women and then also for um, infants. So 
I don't know, you know, in terms of reference doses selection, do we need to make a distinction there? Do we need to choose the more sensitive um, values? Um, do we need to think about the animal data from pups exposure and maternal exposure? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what the toxicologist would think about that, but... Um, I think we need to revisit that point later on when we discuss your contribution. Another question for those of you who have already been down this trail. <coughs> there, there may be well-designed studies in terms of dose response and the ability to <coughs> give confidence of a no ale. But the endpoints that set the no ale are not part of the phthalate syndrome. There is a different, a higher no ale perhaps for those effects. Then which one is the one that is relevant for your evaluation? If, if the most sensitive no oil is body weight but has nothing to do with hormone effects, then is that what it is for that study? This is a tricky question. Um, in, in our paper we've used, we've used what we call reference doses for, for anti-andronicity in order to make the, the comparison in order to avoid the trap of comparing apples with pears. But, um, so part of the answer to your point would be, yeah, we could continue doing doing this, but there's often, um, I think from memory, there's a couple of phthalates that, that are ADIs or other any ADIs anyway, but points of departure are based not on anti-andronicity but on other effects, and sometimes they are lower than the anti-andronicity. Now, Right, the, the public might say, why are they basing hazard index or risk assessment on points of departure that are higher than sort of the, the official one used in by other regulatory um, agencies? I think that's an important point which we need to discuss. I think there would be a case to argue, of course, if available, we should use the ADIs or TDIs used by regulatory authorities. Otherwise, we're potentially ending up in a big sort of trouble. There will be questions asked, why have we used um, reference doses that are higher than the uh, recommended ADIs? But then there would also I have no answer to that question at the moment. But, but then there would be another group of people who hmm. are saying that the whole emphasis here is the fact that these cause a mm -hmm. syndrome of effects based on hormonal activity. And now you're using fetal body weight that's totally independent of hormonal status to define, to make these risk decisions. So that's a disconnect as well. I think you have to do both evaluations for all yep. the endpoints because so. in the hazard index approach with the cumulative assessment we need a single endpoint or a single syndrome of endpoint end area but uh, for the individual evaluation of the chemical you need to, to state also the other endpoints which might be lower. I think that's especially true for some of the substitutes the phthalate substitutes where the developmental <coughs> endpoint may not be important, but something else might be. I'm getting confused here. Maybe you can try to simplify these. What, what, we're, what we're saying is that there's going to be a constellation of intake doses that we're going to be working from versus one or another that we were supposed to be selecting before. Each. What, what are we, where, where, where are we heading with this? Is it Depending on the endpoint, you have different right. reference doses. Reference doses, okay. Fine. Depending on the endpoint. All right, so you, and the reference doses will be based upon your best judgment versus EPA's versus somebody else's? No, it's, uh, I'm trying to figure out where the regulatory agency values come in versus what you're proposing. Well, I made the point that <coughs> these are not regulatory reference doses here. Right, I understand that, which is fine with me. But I think the point was being made is that if we don't 
reference them the regulatory doses, we will get criticized. We should. We should, re we should reference them. I think that's a task uh, of you, Bernard, in, in, in the compilation of the data to, to compile the, yeah. the, the regulatory reference doses and so on. Well, well, also the Section 108 charge doesn't doesn't specify phthalate syndrome or antiandrogenic effects or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I think we should keep an eye on, <coughs> on regulatory ADIs. I really do. Often, uh, I mean, to a degree, this problem will be probably academic because uh, for a lot of phthalates they're simply not available, but uh, yeah. for some they are. <laughs> I guess the more we talk about what we do with respect to other agency values and the comparability and the reason why we chose something versus them, even though there are people that are complaining, at least it's based upon science and judgment that we put out before them, this is what X is using, this is why we're using Y. And, and then we stand on our own two feet, which is fine. Can I also a little addition? I keep myself, I keep switching myself off all the time. <laughs> a little addition to the hazard index. I, I think, I mean, we did this in our paper and you did this in your, um, in your text as well, based the hazard index on endpoints all related to antiandronicity. But um, there is, of course, a precedent for deliberately comparing apples with pears, especially with the hazard index approach. Um, AT, uh, ATSDR uh, is routinely doing this for Superfund assessments. They, they integrate over all sorts of endpoints. So if there are different ADIs available for certain phthalates, we might just use this as well and then see where we end up. Or have to do it, I don't know. My understanding of that is that um, it's a it's a place to start with a, yes. like a super fund, and if you're so far below one, it, it by making the assumptions just put it all together with apples and pears, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then you just stop because it's not an issue. Yeah. But if you are up in, a, in an area where you're concerned, yeah. then you can go back yeah, in yeah. And, and focus it more. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we are discussing that later. But we should for the hazard index uh, do a tiered mm -hmm. analysis, sort of moving from a data poor situation to data rich. We're, we're preempting a discussion. Yes. So, but we would expect, so a table in this section though that would have uh, the most conservative, the lowest yeah. estimate for reference dose, and then the one associated with anti-endogenicity, I think yeah. set us up nicely yeah. for the next. And, and some issue uh, about uncertainty, whether or not we want to derive an uncertainty factor in this chapter, or at least some sense of that. And if, could you also tabulate um, regulatory ADIs with their points of departure and uncertainty factors so that one can see whether they're different from um, points of departures related to anti hmm. I made it real to myself to do that. Oh, thank you. But Mike Shaking his head as if he already has that. Well, a while oh, back, yeah, yes, yes. Holger asked us to okay. compile a list of published TDIs, ADIs, whatever, and, and we did that. So yeah. that, that could be a starting point for that. Yeah. Okay. Russ, I have a question. Phil. Yes, Phil. Um, just following that discussion, and uh, we just received from, from Mike um, tables that give us the TDI, ADI, RFDs. Uh, for various uh, regulatory agencies, couldn't we uh, add to that uh, several columns that relate to the reference doses that we agree upon as a committee? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Bill, we, we just agreed to that right before, I think, when you were trying to get on the phone. Okay. We, we, we said that that is a starting place yeah. for exactly what you said. Russ, I have a question for you. When when I extracted information <coughs> from the CERHR reports, there was a section in there on humans. And when I did the literature review, there was another section in the literature review on human studies. But now it looks like we have human 
epidemiology data in two different places. And I would defer to you, which is easy for those for which the CERHR has no report. I could go through and take out all the references to their human studies, their human reviews, and just make note that you are capturing those. But how do you all feel is the best way to do that? I, I, I guess my preference would be to include it all in the human yeah. chapter. Um, give, given, I mean, the amount of tox studies versus human, I would go back to each of the original human papers and write my own summary of it or include it rather than using what the CERH had done before for the human studies. But you can at least use that as a starting place. Yeah, I think to identify the studies. Yeah. yeah. Well then, I will assume that you're going to take those out of my section. Yes. And when I write a revision, I'll just systematically take that out. Yeah. Yeah, I already, while we were just talking, I was going through and circling the ones okay. that, yeah, the reference list and then moving them, yeah. Uh, for the more recent studies, for, from the literature reviews that we received, there is no CERHR report, but there are references to human studies. I'm assuming you'll take those as well. Yes. And I'll take yes. a lot of mine. Yes. Okay, yeah. I, I'm more comfortable with that. And then you can have them in as much... You can put them in yours in as much detail as you want. <coughs> Good. That's helpful. It'll make the report cleaner. Over. I just want to point out that DIDP is missing here. Okay. Okay. Yes, we 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 had that we mentioned that in our discussion with Phil and I did earlier. I missed that, Bernard. What was that? Holger. DIBP is missing. Oh, yes. Yeah, and I think that's one of the ones we're still waiting for the, the tox review. I'm, I'm hoping so. Okay, any, anything else <coughs> on this reproductive part? Uh, another variable in here is that <coughs> there are many different kinds of reproductive studies, the protocols, and some of them are much more useful than others in terms of completeness and standardization of design. But there are some that are of unusual designs that still contribute information. So I have not attempted to just pick out those that meet the OECD or the EPA guidelines for protocol, and sometimes they're the best ones and sometimes they're not. And sometimes the NTP ones are the best ones. But if they use a continuous breeding protocol, that's a whole different kind of study than a two or three generation reproductive study. In some ways it's better, some ways it's not. So I haven't attempted to, to flag all of those variations in there. Some of them are important, like the diet, with the way of preparing the diet for dose. But the design of the study, um, if there was only one design a study that detected these effects, then we're wasting an awful lot of energy coming up with alternate designs. So I've kind of accepted a variety of studies. A anything else on the report? I think the NRC report on flat dates had a nice chapter on on the significance of the different study designs uh, in terms of finding the relevant endpoints for the flat dates, uh, that the old OECD protocols uh, wouldn't be within the window of sustainability and so on. So I think there's a yeah. lot we can learn from the NRC report of the late yeah. <coughs> Okay, that's all very helpful. It'll keep me busy for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, I think we're up to you. Okay, um, well, I think you've, you've already covered in your section a lot of the relevant points uh, related to uh, my section. Um, does the committee have any specific um, comments or requests about the way I've put it together? And uh, He's the next one. 
just a comment on style to get your reaction <clears throat> to that. I sorted out the CERHR report more distinctly separate from the rest of it than Phil did. And not that we have to be identical in how we do that, but <clears throat> I would And I sort of follow your uh, approach in, in a sense that I start off with what I uh, give a summary of the NTP CERHR report, um, and oftentimes just taking quotes directly from uh, that text, and then follow that by uh, studies that had been published since that report was issued. Yeah. Um, I think the only big difference between yours and mine is the number of subheadings. I think the content is very similar. <laughs> yes. And I've given relevant references that both the NTP study used and then the, the references that have been published since that report. Yeah. And I've asked Mike to uh, look and make sure that I've been in, all inclusive in terms of uh, the studies and that he's agreed to do that. Uh, and I will include any other studies that I've missed. Uh, what I haven't done is uh, give any critique of an individual study, which uh, there's been some discussion uh, today about doing that. And I think, um, Byrne, you and I need to sit down and, and discuss how we might do that in a, in a consistent way. I, I agree. Phil, in, in addition to a consistent way, whether or not it's appropriate for us to do that, there are some, there's the benefit of having a group like CERHR where you've got six, seven, eight, nine, ten people sitting around who are all experts in slightly different areas. So they can go through a series of papers and somebody is an expert on sperm, somebody else is an expert on ova, somebody else is an expert on growth. So you, you probably get comments on the value of a study from a broader base of experience than, than I could bring to the table for reviewing a, a wide range of manuscripts. So I, I was okay with put bringing forward in the <coughs> comments something that the CERH, CERHR concluded about the weakness of a study. I was a little bit more cautious of doing that on my own judgment. Well, I think that Andreas made a critical point relative to uh, the suitability of individual studies for determining points of departure. And, um, you know, I need to have a lot of uh, discussion about what constitutes an adequate study for determining a point of departure. Uh, if, if we're going to say that we should or I should evaluate each of the uh, publications that was produced subsequent to the NTP report. So I think that gets to be a really tricky issue of what constitutes an adequate study. Let's see if we can take that another step further. If, a, if studies, let's say for the developmental toxicity area, <clears throat> if a study is designed to meet FDA regulations, and they meet EPA regulations and they follow a, an accepted OECD protocol, can you get a point of departure out of there? Absolutely. And an OL. Uh, it's, yeah. it's expected yeah. that you would have an OL. So that helps. Phil, does that answer part of the question? I think so, yes. Yeah. But wouldn't that point, the uh, route of exposure, be important for that? Yeah. You, I think if a study is in the literature that's by an irrelevant route of exposure, <coughs> I, I wouldn't even consider it. For I wouldn't ask, is there a point of departure here for an irrelevant route of exposure? I would just not use that study. That, that's my own gut feel. Would it, would it be helpful to know that there was that there was a, a different point of departure, a different noel for giving phthalates intraperitoneally? So what would be a what would be a route of exposure that you would eliminate at hand? Well, intraperitoneal. That would be about it. 
I mean, you, you, you might be interested in elation right. and normal and diet and right. garage. Right. Those, those are all somewhat relevant. But what about uh, installation versus Not relevant, I don't think, for phthalates. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I take your point, but I don't think we come across a phthalate study where they instilled into the lung or something. Okay. Well, would, that be, would that make a difference? Because I know in some cases it does, in some cases it doesn't. Phil, what else? Um, well, one of the things that, that I have done is not part of the uh, document that I submitted, but I've actually put together some, some tables where I'm uh, summarizing uh, the studies, particularly those that were published since the NTP report, uh, in terms of uh, the endpoints that were, were monitored uh, whether there were significant increases and decreases. And I've also put together another table um, that summarizes uh, studies that have been completed with regard to mode of action. So looking at uh, testosterone production, uh, gene expression, et cetera. So um, those aren't complete yet. I'm still working on those, but those are two tables that will be in this section as well as others that we deem necessary. Well, if you can send me a copy of the, the format for the table for summarizing studies, not the mode of action <coughs> one, but the other one, then I won't reinvent a new, a new table. Yeah, they, they might not. Uh, well, we, we can talk about that. Okay. But the, the, the point of, of the tables, I think, coming after the brief descriptions of the studies was to eventually get to the point of saying uh, this is a, a reference dose that seems to be uh, related to the most sensitive endpoint. That's what I was trying to get at and maybe that's not where we want to go. Well, well I guess when you're ready it might be best send them to Mike and let him distribute them to all of us. Because okay. a variety of input would be helpful on the, on the design of tables. So that we produce tables that allow us to crosswalk from one part to another. As one of the things I was trying to do was to, uh, uh, I looked at a paper by Robert Benson. I don't know whether the other members of the committee have looked at that. Yeah. Uh, but they do a, a nice job for uh, many of the fellows that we're interested in in terms of summarizing the data. And then they, they have a table of brief fellows in which they uh, cite specific papers which they use to then take the, the Noel, Noel, or whatever and come up with a reference dose. And so I was following that um, approach in in my uh, section. Is that appropriate or not? Phil, I, I think that's appropriate. Yeah, I, I think that's sort of what you've done in your paper, isn't that right, Andreas? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. I've, I've actually put together a table comparing uh, reference doses uh, obtained by different groups and uh, you know they're not that different and I, but I might just add uh, when you say the most sensitive endpoint you might have your table have the most sensitive endpoint but then also uh, the, maybe the most sensitive anti-androgen endpoint uh, if, if there's well, they could do that What other comments are there for Phil? I guess it's not a comment for Phil or you, but it's more of a 
general question about the um, dipole <coughs> tally, how that will be handled or what, what data exists. Which one? Dipental. Because there was the, the recent paper showing that it was, yep. and whether, um, I mean, I haven't looked in terms of what Hoger and Chris have done in terms of including that or not, or if there, I don't think there is biomonitoring data. Well, because it is more potent than the others, it, we agree that it, as Phil and I, and I think Mike have talked about this, we agree that it needs to be in there someplace. We need to make reference to the fact that here's, here's one that isn't, to which exposure probably isn't widespread. But if, for example, that were brought in to be a substitute, that there would be a reason not to do that. So we need to mention it here someplace in the report, but here's another phthalate that's even more toxic than the other ones that we worry about. But what we do beyond that, we have to figure out. That, we yeah, agree it should be that's included. That's what I was asking. Yeah, I, I agree it should be included, but I was asking what, what we do with it beyond that. Yeah. <coughs> that, that, that paper is provocative in two ways. First of all, the, the potency <coughs> of, of DPP and the other point in that paper is that the strain used, which is the Harlan's Dolly, seems to be more sensitive to phthalate syndrome-like effects than the previously used Charles River Dolly, previously used by uh, Gray's lab, for example. So there's, a, there's another point there which we need to address. So maybe it's necessary to judge or evaluate a little with an eye on that, the, the previously published evidence. It is, do you know of anybody who is now doing the, the kinds of testing that we've done in the other strains of rats? Are they doing, are they testing this phthalate in other strains to see how much strain difference and sensitivity there is? I'm, I'm not sure. I think that might well happen, but they, they switched for some reason, NTP switched to the um, Harlan. I think because everyone else does, I have no idea, but. Well, I think that we, we certainly uh, need to discuss this further, how we're going to use whatever information is available on uh, DPP. Um, that's, that's something that the chat has to discuss. Mike, can you remember what, yeah, I'm sure you can, if you've ever seen it, you remember it. The data that you have within your CPSC exposure for <coughs> this particular talent? Well, we haven't seen it, as far as I know, it's not a, it's not a product. Um, but it's, it's potency, I mean, it's right in the middle of the structure activity range so um, you know I think it's appropriate to include it in, in some way in the report uh, you don't have to answer for EPA and FDA but do you suspect their search for phthalates would include this one um, well I, I, I don't have EPA's list in front of me uh, of the ones they're looking at it's I don't yeah that pencil's included. It would have been it would have been reported if it was found because it was looked for. Well, they're looking they're uh, including it in their um, hazard review oh, and okay. you know uh, right. reference to so on. But as far as exposures, I don't know. But if, if FDA doesn't analyze for it, then it's not in any reports. It would be. Yeah, I, I don't know anyone who, who's analyzed for it in any sort of products. I measure it in, in, in our HBM studies for a couple of years now, and I never find it. You've never seen it? It's a good job. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Larry, would you repeat that? Holger says they've looked for it for a couple of years and haven't found it. Okay. We think, I mean, we're not sure about whether or not EPA and FDA look for it, so that they haven't found it 
and the report is that that they analyzed for it and it wasn't there or the possibility that FDA isn't looking for it. Well, I, 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 Dan just reminded me, I, I forget where we heard this, but I think there's a paper coming out from Califat where if you look hard enough, you will find it. In a large percentage of the, of the samples that they measure. Yeah, the levels are very low, but you can, at low detection limits, you can detect it in some individuals. So I actually have positive detects, but at very, very low levels. And we are right now discussing where it is coming from. Is it a side product or degradation product or I don't know. Well, in, is your work in multiple tests or just for a single measurement of a person or just a single measurement? You have no idea. It's fair. In, in, in the NHANES or your data, or NHANES, they've looked for it and not detected it previous? Or has it not been measured? measured? Yeah. But is, it, is it in the newest? In the newest uh, I don't know about the newest. Um, but normally they had tested for it. Yeah, that's the, that's the latest CDC paper that was referred to in our workshop that's, that was pre-publication. So I think it's out now. Mm -hmm. It's worth checking into. Yeah. But are they going to include it in the biomonitoring studies or was this just a research publication? It was a research publication. Yeah. Just, do, do we need, I think we need to take this another step further or we'll meet again in three months and have the same discussion. Can, who, who could be asked to pull together what's known about this particular cell? So that next time, before the next time we have the report, what the thinking is of where it's coming from, how, what is the limit of detection compared to other phthalates that we're looking for? Yeah. Well, I, I think it, people haven't looked for it because it's not a commercial product. <coughs> um, but as far as the data, I think that's one of the touch reviews that's coming. Okay. Good. So then we'll know more. So anything else for Phil? Thank you, Phil. Okay, thank you. Hi, right, Phil. It may not it may not be lunchtime at your place, but it is here. <laughs> no, it's not quite. I haven't had breakfast yet. Oh. oh. <laughs> I think we're ready <coughs> to adjourn for lunch here. And let's let's reconvene in forty five minutes. Twelve o'clock. Good talking to you, Bye. We'll call you back, Phil. All right.